Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the first meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee of 2022, which we'll, we will be conducting remotely this week. And a Happy New Year to everyone. We also welcome back Natalie Dawn uh, to the committee. At Agenda Item 1, we have consideration of whether to take Agenda Items 4 and 5 in private. Agenda Item 4 is consideration of today's evidence. Agenda Item 5 is consideration of our work programme. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. So, items four and five will be taken in private. We now move on and welcome our first witnesses in respect of our inquiry into the role of, role of local government and its cross sectoral partners in delivering in Net Zero Scotland. The committee launched this inquiry in December with a call for views that will close on the 21st of January. This inquiry is about the role of local government and its partners in helping to meet national net zero targets. During later evidence sessions, the committee will hear from a range of cross-sector partner organisations working with local authorities, but the committee agreed it would be very important at the beginning in our opening evidence sessions that we should hear from councils themselves. We are therefore hearing today from a cross-section of councils representing regions across Scotland. The first panel comprises the leaders of Scotland's three largest city councils. I am very pleased to welcome Councillor Susan Aitken, Glasgow City Council, Councillor Jenny Lang, Aberdeen City Council, Councillor Adam McVeigh, City of Edinburgh. Thank you all very much for accepting our invitation today, and uh, it's very good to see you. I believe that each of you would like to make a brief opening statement, and for the sake of simplicity, probably easiest to go in alphabetical order. So in other words, Aberdeen, Edinburgh to be followed by Glasgow. So, Jenny, I will hand over to you to make your opening statement, uh, to be followed by Adam and then Susan. Thank you very much, convener. Um, as leader of Aberdeen City Council, I'm delighted to have been asked to take part in today's committee session, as it affords me the opportunity to provide some information about the part our council and city are playing in helping Scotland and the UK achieve their net zero targets and allows me to provide my views on the, the challenges and barriers local government is currently facing in relation to the delivery of the Net Zero Agenda. I think Aberdeen City Council and indeed Aberdeen as a, a whole certainly recognises the cross-sector and interdependent climate challenges we all face, and we have stepped up to these challenges. Indeed, having been the host city for the UK oil and gas sector for over half a century, and given many of our citizens' lives and livelihoods are strongly linked to what happens offshore, Aberdeen has a, a unique economic and social imperative as an energy city to ensure we make a just transition to net zero. Capitalising on our significant influence as the local authority, the Council has taken the lead. and This has involved us using our, our own very limited resources to coordinate partners and stakeholders in the development and delivery of a place-based plan, as well as pushing ahead with the delivery of net zero projects within our own organisation. I believe the committee has had sight of our Council Climate Change Plan, which does cover our own assets and operations. But this is only a small part of the story, as Aberdeen City Council, in common with many other local authorities, has been working diligently on these matters for, for many years. Indeed, we drew up Aberdeen's first Sustainable Energy Action Plan in 2015, and our city-region deal, which was signed in 2016, also has energy transition at its heart. We have also developed a hydrogen strategy in 2015, and have invested heavily in this emerging technology over the last decade. And in June 2020, we brought forward a net-zero vision for Aberdeen, accompanied by a strategic infrastructure plan for energy transition both of which are aligned to the national net zero targets. As part of that work, we established a net zero leadership board and delivery unit, which has a, a membership from across the private and public sectors. And they provide advice and direction on our place-based net zero approach. And we're currently in the process of finalising a net zero Aberdeen route map for 2045. This hopefully gives you an insight into what Aberdeen City Council is trying to do on the ground in relation to net zero targets. But this has not been easy because whilst councils have statutory climate duties to meet for our own organisations, there are currently little or no statutory duties, guidance, support or funding for councils to act on area-wide emissions. 
and councils are also expected to keep abreast of and engage with and respond to the extensive and fast-moving legislation, policies and consultation across a wide range of sectors and subjects related to climate change with little or no support. And I think we all accept that if we are to achieve our net zero goals, the level and pace of action required is considerable, and Aberdeen City Council is certainly keen to play its part. But I think I would have to argue that further development and delivery requires both national coordination and support, as well as finance, additional capacity, skills, innovation, and the foundations of robust data. So I'm looking forward to being able to discuss that with the committee members this morning. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you very much, Jenny. That's a very helpful overview, and uh, you raised some issues that I'm sure we'll explore further in questions. Let me bring in uh, Adam McVeigh to be followed by Susan Aitken for brief opening statements. Adam, over to you. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I did want to just highlight at the start that if we are to keep um, global temperatures to a 1.5 degree rise, the action that we have to take globally in the next nine years now to 2030 is quite dramatic. Um, and that will not be a linear process. Our cities have to be the leaders of that, and cities like Edinburgh have to get to net zero by that timescale if the world is to keep that um, those, those temperatures limited to that level. Um, I did want to say that Dramatic action, while it's needed and while it's not particularly easy, and Edinburgh is um, members of the committee, I'm sure will know, uh, trying to take a whole host of actions that are not easy to deliver in areas like transport. And as we face into the energy uh, mix of how we heat homes and decarbonise heat within our city, um, I, I think we'll see again difficulties in how we develop that. But the crucial thing that I really want to get over is that when we put our um, climate strategy out for consultation, nearly a thousand residents responded to that. It was a big, uh, meaty consultation, so it was great to have that level of engagement. But 77% of people supported the actions in it. Now, the rest were split between those who either thought it was going too far or not going far enough. Um, but 85% of people in Edinburgh supported the vision supported the aim of reducing carbon emissions and getting to net zero by 2030. And I do just want to say, while the actions that are needed are dramatic, and while the actions um, that Edinburgh and other councils are pursuing are dramatic in terms of transport, in terms of increasingly uh, decarbonisation of heat um, in particular, the public and people in our communities understand it. They understand the rationale of why these actions are needed. They understand why the world needs to change and are up for that change. And at Edinburgh, we've spent quite a lot of time trying to build the right mechanisms for that um, public engagement and those that kind of two-way conversation. So we have a climate commission, which I'm vice chair of, and we have an independent chair of, which provides scrutiny not just to the council but right across sectorally. Um, in Edinburgh, we also have a climate compact, which was signed by key industry leaders right across the city. So our festivals, our banks, universities, the major parts of our economy um, that are um, that are the carbon emitters, if you like, uh, because we all are, um, have signed up to that. And the next waves of those signatories keep on going as more and more companies sign up to learn um, to, to sign up to the specific actions that they need. Our Climate strategy, you'll be very pleased, Kimberly. I'm not going to go into enormous detail on because it's about 100 odd um, actions, and I'm sure people will have read it or not. Um, I think it was submitted and written evidence. But the two areas that we need to focus on specifically are heat reduction and decarbonisation of heat, and there will be a plethora of actions that we need to take uh, to do that, and in transport. And unfortunately, in a city like Edinburgh, the solutions are not particularly easy and do not respect the lifestyle that people have come become accustomed to. We need to change the way we live within our communities, we need to change the way we live within our cities if we're to get to a proper renewable and sustainable footing. So um I'll just re emphasize the point that while these actions are dramatic, I think the people of Scotland, certainly the people of Edinburgh, are fully supportive of the direction of travel and the actions that are that are needed and what we've seen when we've discussed this in forums and we've partnered with not only 
um, key partners in the economy, but the Edinburgh Centre for Edit, sorry, the Edinburgh Climate Change Institute as well, and driving a lot of this forward. And we've also partnered with our voluntary organisation, Umbrella um, Representative Body EVOC, to try and build the right kind of citizen engagement right across the board with our communities. And I think we are, through that partnership, through that dialogue, um, building a, a lot of support for the tangible actions that will make progress. Thanks very much, Adam. That's a very helpful overview again. And uh, finally, let me bring in Susan Aitken for um, her opening statement. Susan, over to you. Um, thanks very much, convener, and thanks very much for the invitation to talk to the committee this morning. It, very good timing, I think. Uh, not only just because it's the the first committee session of 2022, um, but it's two months since COP26. Um, COP26, which is the the president of COP26, Alok Sharma said, was the start of what needs to be a decade of action. Um, but that two months has given us, I think, a little bit of time to take stock and reflect on um, what hopefully was a concentration of minds in this space. It is a new space for everyone uh, to a certain degree. Um, although there has been work on climate action ongoing at national and at local level for a number of years, um, the, the pace and the urgency of change that is that needs to take place in the next decade. And I think I would echo um, Councillor McVeigh in, in um, emphasising that none of this is optional. Um, this is something that we have to do. Uh, the pace, the financing behind it, um, ensuring our structures and systems are prepared to meet the change, um, a just transition to net zero essentially being the organising principle behind everything that we do at every level of government. Um, it is a big step up for all of us. One of our responsibilities as the um, host city for COP26 in Glasgow was to give voice and a platform to cities and to local leaderships on the climate agenda. Um, and there was a genuine global exchange of information, of ideas, policy solutions, um, a real sense of solidarity as well um, among local government, among municipalities globally, um, and an understanding that regardless of geography or political stripe or the character of the authority that we lead, there is that shared recognition that it is local, at local level where the change um, to, uh, that, that is required on the ground to reach net zero will be delivered. Um, local authorities, and particularly in the first instance in this crucial next decade, particularly cities, are going to be the delivery vehicles for action towards net zero, and national governments are not going to be able to meet their targets if we, they do not firstly support um, and uh, uh, get behind local government and give local government the confidence that we need to deliver net zero, um, but in particular front load action into cities, which is clearly where most of the emissions uh, take place and therefore where the, the greatest gains in, in reducing emissions are. Um, the national targets are not going to be achieved without recognising um, that it will be local delivery that makes the difference. Net zero essentially will be achieved in places and with people. And that's what city and local authority leaderships do every single day: practical actions and solutions um, to influence and improve places and the lives of citizens. But our democratic mandate also gives us the convening power that's required to mobilise partnerships and collaborations, um, and those will be absolutely essential. We're not going to deliver on this agenda without collaboration, whether that's across the public sector, uh, with business and industry, with communities, crucially, with academia, with civil society. All of those will be um, must play their part in delivering those practical solutions to the specific challenges around net zero. I'll not go into a huge amount of detail just now about um, the specifics of what we're doing in Glasgow. Hopefully, that will um, have an opportunity to emerge in response to the questions. Um, our Climate Emergency Action Plan, with our commitment to reach net zero by 2030, um, is also submitted in evidence and. Um, is, is um, extensive and substantial. Hopefully, committee members will have a chance to uh, have looked at that. This is very clearly, though, not just a council 
um, emergency, climate emergency plan. It is a city plan, um, and it is supported by uh, the Sustainable Glasgow Partnership, which I chair, but which is very much um, a partnership with delivery hubs below the strategic board, which are focused on um, coordinating and uh, implementing that practical action to get to net zero. And I would also just add, finally, that we are currently consulting on um, our, our Glasgow Green Deal, which is um, out for a, a call for ideas with communities and citizens just now. And that Green Deal will also provide that overarching plan uh, to make net zero the organising principle of everything that we do, not just as a local authority, but all partners across the city. Um, and uh, I, I hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to discuss that in more detail um, as time goes on, um, and it might be something that uh, the committee would be interested in at some point in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, those opening statements provide a, a really good overview uh, for our question session, which we uh, move on to now. Uh, let me let me start uh, with uh, some evidence we heard in the last committee meeting from the UK Climate Change Committee. They shared concerns about whether local government has the necessary resources, capacity, budget, expertise and, and powers uh, to deliver everything that is being required in the context of, of net zero, especially in the context of uh, recent budgets where we have seen a real terms decline in the local government settlement. Um, some of the opening statements uh, address some of these concerns. So I, I think these concerns are recognised uh, by each of you. Uh, it would be helpful for the committee to understand what in what particular areas you face the greatest challenges, whether it is resources, capacity, budget, powers or, or, or expertise, and uh, if you could uh, let me know how you intend to address those challenges and what additional help you, you might need from the Scottish Government to help address uh, the challenges you face in the transition to net zero. Again, let us go in alphabetical order. So I will start with Jenny, then Adam and then Susan. So Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, in my opening remarks, I, I made comment about the various aspects that I felt we needed to address. And you've quite rightly pointed out that um, you know, budgets to uh, local government have uh, seen a decline over a number of years. So it is difficult for us. Um, I mean, I agree with my, my colleagues that uh, councils are definitely the ones that should be driving this, particularly ones in our seven cities. But it does require us to have the finances in which to do that. As a local authority, we've invested heavily ourselves, as I mentioned, in hydrogen technology. But there is only so far that you can go with that um, without uh, you know, that, that additional um, help from, from a, a national level. Um, and what I would say is that uh, we've, we've looked at how we can take an innovative approach um, to leveraging in private finance um, from the, the private sector. And I think we've done that to good effect with the, the joint venture that we've set up with BP recently around our hydrogen hub. And that is very much about us making sure that we can get that inward investment from the private sector as well as coming through government grant. But what I would say is, um, you know, on, a, on another theme, I think it was uh, Adam touched on the fact that we needed to, uh, you know, energy within um, our, you know, residential and commercial buildings will be key to us reaching our, our net zero targets. And Glasgow and Aberdeen have been looking at, uh, you know, projects around uh, demonstrator projects around that retrofitting. But the whole focus of ourselves and, and government is on that social housing aspects. And, and in Aberdeen itself, with 22,000 council homes, um, we have an eye-watering target of £1 billion, probably, to do that retrofit within our own housing stock. But what about the private sector? Where is the focus around how we actually um, help our own private residents to uh, you know, make those changes? I, I agree with colleagues that the, the, the public are there. They want to play their part in that net zero target, but they don't have the, the means um, at their own disposal to, to come forward um, with those changes, particularly when the technology is uh, not at a stage where it's comparable with uh, more um, conventional means of, of heating and indeed vehicles and various other aspects. 
So it is about us investing in technology, and it's also about us investing in skills and training within our own organisations. Because, quite frankly, there is there is more and more, um, uh, you know, put on to local councils. The uh, you know government quite rightly wants us to play our part, but we don't have the capacity within our organisations. Um, to actually be stepping up to the plate without that further investment coming, and indeed greater capacity being built within councils, um, you know, in order to, to to move forward with that agenda. And I think there are serious difficulties when our budgets are being cut. We are looking at ways in which we can streamline our own organisations. Uh, that all results in a lack of capacity at a local level in order to bring forward some of the. Uh, schemes and policies that will be required in order for us to meet our net zero targets. Um, a, a prime example of that is, uh, you know, the the money that was put on the table or announced at the budget um, in relation to the North East for that just transition. Um, the money was put on the table, 20 million. It raises expectations within communities, um, within businesses and stakeholders. But there is no detail, there is no um, communication with local authority around what that money can be spent on, how it can be utilised, how it can be used. So I think there is a lack of coordination between local and national government, which will hamper us moving forward. And there's a lack of understanding at a national government level of the costs that are connected with delivering the net zero agenda. And until we have that communication between those levels of government, I think we are going to be very hard pushed to deliver on the agenda that we're all striving for, particularly in the timescales that we're talking about. Thanks very much, Jenny. You touched on a number of areas that I know other committee members want to explore in a, in a bit more detail. Um, let me bring in Adam on, on the same question to be followed by Susan. Ad Adam, over to you. Thank you. Um, not to make it sound like a Brian Cox drama, but it is about money and power um, for local authorities. But I would say to the committee, be mindful about where the arrows are going. The solutions that are being built and crafted and identified at a local level is what needs to be supported. So not every project that Edinburgh Council or any other council will develop in partnership uh, or as a standalone project will be it will be able to wash its own face, will be able to cover its own costs and, and build um, itself in that way. But it will need financial backing. And sometimes what we see is um, government support for projects that are sort of crafted and imagined at government level. And the, for me, the arrows are going the wrong direction when we get to that stage. We need to have finance available from government to support things that are potentially off the radar. Of government and are built and developed at a local council level because that's where the relationships are, that's where the partnerships are, um, and that's where the, the skills are to deliver it. Our city deal that we signed in 2017 um, has been really useful. We started that off in terms of skills, looking at two main areas: one, data-driven innovation and technology skills; another, construction, because we knew that there was a huge pent-up demand for construction projects and inward investment. Um, to deliver that in, in the city. We managed to use some of that construction money in the space of green um, uh, green skills. And so we've looked at how we build the kind of skills pipeline with some of that money um, to try and build the kind of infrastructure that we need as a, at a city level to try and do things like retrofit at bigger scale. So again, it's an example where the money has been really helpful, but the solutions and the crafting of that has been done locally, and I think that's really important. In terms of powers, one of the major things in a city like Edinburgh, and I suspect other cities as well, when you look at the pie chart of our carbon emissions, transport is the, the huge slice of the pie, um, transport and, and heat. And when we look at what we have to do in terms of transport, to decarbonise it, it is looking at things that will need to be taken up at a national level um, in terms of last mile delivery, decarbonising um, haulage and supporting the industry to decarbonise, and also providing financial help to try and enable some of those last mile delivery solutions that we'll need within our city. It is also about 
public transport and decarbonising public transport, and that's about uh, moving to electric and hydrogen buses, um, and it's also about zero on-street emission sources like tram, and making sure that there's no prejudice, if you like, against projects that will deliver mass transit in cities like Edinburgh uh, at no carbon. But there's a there's an elephant in the room, and it's cheap and it's easy, and it's not particularly easy um, on a door-to-door -door level. But we need to walk more, we need to cycle more in a city context. And when you look at the traffic regulation order process that councils have to go to to redesign streets, if there is opposition, uh, which there sometimes is, uh, let's be honest, is is quite long and really quite archaic, and that has to change. Uh, there's a scheme in Edinburgh, the East West Cycleway um, route, huge benefits for cycling, huge improvements to the walking environment as well. Um, that was approved before I was council leader, and I've been a council leader for, for more than four and a half years now. And it's uh, we're only now getting to the point where shovels are going in the ground to build that because of the very drawn out traffic regulation order process. Councils have to be able to change the public realm easier. Of course, we have to consult. Of course, we have to engage with businesses, with communities, but we need to be able to change the landscape and infrastructure of our cities quicker and more effectively if we are to see the drops in carbon emissions associated with transport uh, that we have. I am afraid, despite the, the benefits of um, EV uh, cars, cities like Edinburgh will not be able to reach net zero by 2030. Um, with a, a model that has a congested city of private cars that are petrol moving to a congested city of private cars that are electric. That just will not wash it. So we need to fundamentally change the mix, and the traffic regulation order process needs to empower councils far, far more to work uh, much more quickly, deliver change much more uh, cheaply through the unnecessary um, bureaucracy being stripped out. And allow us to really drive forward change for the benefit of our communities. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, I know that uh, on the transport issues you raised, that Mark Ruskell will want to explore them uh, in a short uh, while. Uh, Susan, let me bring you in the same same opening question in, in terms of the the challenges you face. Um, I'll hand over Thanks. to you. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try not to repeat what other colleagues have said, and I, I agree with a lot of it. I think. Um, Adam has spoken very well about how it works in the context of transport change and changing public space. But more broadly, I suppose we would say that um, regulatory and legislative um, approaches all have to be aligned to have the delivery of net zero happen as quickly as possible and with as few barriers as possible. And that is something that has to come from national level down to local government, um, because local government does not, by and large, have the control over that. One, another um, example that I would add is um, it, it, renewable heat networks, district heating systems, which currently carry um, uh, um, non-domestic rates. Uh, charge, which makes them uh, very difficult uh, for uh, registered social landlords to pursue, for example, um, and can actually stand in the way of that. That is something that government need, needs to address. Um, and it, is, it comes back to this whole point about you know, looking at everything you do systemically um, and making net zero the organising principle in all of it. I think resource is an issue, particularly um, for capacity within local government. Um, we uh, found out fairly quickly in Glasgow that we were lacking particular skills. Um, our uh, inward investment and economic development team were tasked with, ahead of COP26, coming up with a, an investment plan, a net zero investment plan for the city, which we did. Our Glasgow Green Print, uh, which has, is, is Quite um, far ahead in terms of the UK, um, something we recognise we need to do. We needed to do because of COP. Um, but they they are a fantastic team, award winning. But they recognised early doors that they were lacking um, a particular skill set around 
uh, the green economy and green financing. Now, we actually recruited in Glasgow a green economy manager who are part of that team. Um, not all local authorities, particularly when you get to smaller level, will, will necessarily have the ability to do that. But they are going to need those skills too. We are all going to need those skills or we are going to need access to, to um, a shared resource of those skills across local government, because we're going to have to project manage um, some major uh, interventions. Um, we need to um, we need to be able to um, engage with the private sector at a level and at a scale that we've really never done before in local government, not just in Scotland, globally, um, in terms of in terms of financing. Um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of very fast moving technology that we need to get our heads around here. There's going to be proofs of concept and all sorts of pieces of work that have to be done, which um, have not been uh, necessarily the bread and butter of local authorities in the past, um, and which we're by and large not financed to do, we're not resourced to do. But again, coming back to this point of if national targets, both within Scotland and at the UK, are going to be delivered, then local government is going to have to be empowered and given the capacity to do that. Um, I would caution, though, against thinking that um, us getting to net zero and delivering net zero is either about local, local authority budgets or even about um, national government financing um, or just um, about that, because there is no way that it is going to be delivered um, from that. This is about bringing um, the, the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of finance that is out there um, in the world. And this was one of the big themes of discussion at COP26, of course. It is about aligning all of that to deliver net zero. And it is about growing the capacity of local government, and particularly cities, um, to get that in to our um, our projects and, and, and delivering them, um, and to, to give you a bit of um, a bit of context, Glasgow has been very involved in discussions around this, um, and it is I, I emphasise it is a new space. It's a new space for all cities. Um, we've done some work with um, partnership with Bristol. Um, we did some discussions with uh, major organisations, um, Chatham House Rules, but uh, the likes of the World Bank, uh, the World Economic Forum, um, uh, philanthropic organisations like the uh, Bloomberg um, uh, Philanthropies, um, a range of other, and, and some of the big big funders that are out there, the pension funds, um, the global banks who have have their hands on these, uh, you know, trillions and trillions of of dollars, um, and it was very clear that. Um, they they are not used to investing in municipalities. Where, where all the public partnership, uh, private partnerships are in the world, they tend not to be at city level. Um, even uh, you know, or, or perhaps apart from the kind of the world's mega cities, uh, but certainly you know, kind of medium-sized, in the global term cities like Glasgow, um, we tend not to be in that space because we're talking about you know, it's not. Again, to give some context, perhaps you know one of the biggest financial deals that has ever been done by any local authority in the UK was our Equal Pay deal in Glasgow back in 2018. Um, that was half a billion pounds. Um, but Jenny was talking about retrofitting, rightly, and Adam touched on that as well, which is one of the most important things um, that we can we can all do um, to to get a big gain in emissions reduction. Um, the work that we've done in Glasgow on a regional level, um, across the Glasgow city region, around 450,000 homes require to be retrofitted, um, and it will be about £11 billion um, is, the, is the calculation of cost. So this is a space that we are we've never been anywhere near that before. Um, you know, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands or even tens of millions. It is tens of billions of pounds. Um, the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission, which emerged from the work that we, we did with Bristol, um, and which use, it involves the 10 UK core cities, uh, which are the 10 biggest outside London, of which Glasgow is one, and also all the London boroughs. Um, the calculation is that to get all of us collectively to net zero will be two hundred billion pounds um, over the next decade. Um, so that's you know that's the kind of space we're talking about. This is not about local government budgets. 
what national governments and local government have to do in partnership. Um, and, and the Scottish Government is, of course, hamstrung on, on how much it can do this because it does not have the full range of, of fiscal levers. Um, the UK Government um, is, is absolutely crucial in this. Um, they, they need to stand behind local government, and we do need to be able to give citizens um, a, a reassurance and a guarantee that this is not going to be delivered at the expense of their public services. Um, th and that public services will be protected, so that exactly that it isn't local authority budgets that are going to be delivering these major interventions, huge infrastructure projects, whether it's in heat or transport or um, the reconfiguring of public space. And the final point I would make on this um, particular area around financing is all of us needing to understand that um, we should not talk about paying for net zero. This is about, it's almost, a, it's cash flowing net zero. It is a, an investment. Um, it's not a money saving thing in terms of local government budgets or, um, or, or even um, national government budgets. But in the longer term, what it is, is transformational in the way that we um, we resource society, we resource public services. And the benefits that investment in net zero deliver uh, will far outweigh um, the, the, the costs of it now, um, whether that is in improved health, whether it is in um, more, a more sustainable green economy and the jobs that come out of that, a whole range of areas. Um, and the, Some of the work that has been done for the UK Climate, Cities Climate Investment Commission, um, they reckon that for, ev for every pound invested in getting to net zero just now, um, you are delivering nine or ten pounds in, in benefits. Um, for society and, and the economy. Um, so that is the kind of space that we all need to be in, in thinking about how we resource this, how we front load investment in capacity and in empowering um, where this action and delivery is going to take place most quickly and most effectively, and that is at local authority level. Okay, thanks very much, Susan. Let, let me um, explore further uh, briefly an area that each of you have uh, touched on in, in your opening remarks, the, the heat and building strategy announced a couple of months ago by um, the Scottish Government, which is going to be led by uh, local authorities. As you know, this, this includes a target to make at least one million homes across Scotland energy efficient and convert them to zero emissions heating. The Scottish Government has estimated this will cost £33 billion, uh, with £1.8 billion committed by the Scottish Government over the next Five years. A few questions in this area, and, and if you could keep the answers quite brief and focused, I, I appreciate it's a big area, uh, but we are um, up against the clock. What percentage of properties in your local authority area do you think you will be able to convert by 2030? How will this be financed, and have you agreed the required financing with the Scottish Government? Uh, we'll, we'll go in the same order as before. So we'll start with Jenny, then Adam, then Susan. As I said, I'm, I'm sorry, we're up against time. So if you could keep your answers quite focused, that would be great because we've got a huge amount of ground to cover. Uh, Jenny, over to you. Um, thank you, convener. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we've uh, we've we've looked at uh, some retrofit uh, demonstrator projects to try and get uh, an estimate on the, the the cost that we'd be connected. We have some unique challenges in Aberdeen because of the vast amount of properties that are actually built from granite, which brings its own challenges. And you know, it's it's not that easy to um, provide the energy efficiency within those types of buildings. The other thing that we have in the city, which is under local authority control, is a large number of high-rise buildings, which you may have seen as recently. Uh, you know, there's been some listing. Uh, through Historic Environment Scotland in relation to those buildings, which will cause us challenges. Um, I, I mentioned there that a billion pounds is what we are looking at in order to um, you know, retrofit and convert and provide the energy efficiency within our own council housing stock. Um, we have to do that through our housing revenue account. Um, at, the, at the moment, um, there are pots of money that become available, but I think what I would say there is often the timescales connected to them are short. Um, we need the opportunity to 
uh, you know, have uh, contractors appointed, various other things. And I think I touched on the skills base and what we are seeing is out there um, within our, uh, you know, the contracting world, whether it's the construction industry or indeed the engineers and various other uh, professionals that are connected with projects, we don't feel that the skill base is there currently. So I think we are really going to be very much up against the clock in order to try and provide that by 2030. And I'm not aware of any extensive discussions that we've had with Scottish government or officials in relation to providing that, other than some of the demonstrator projects that we've done ourselves. And I, I note that in, in Glasgow there's been similar work carried out. But based on what we're doing, it's a drop in the ocean compared to what's required um, moving forward. And I think what will be key is the, the private sector coming in. And we may well have to look at how we deal with um, energy efficiency within our own homes moving forward. At the moment, we all own the assets generally. We buy the, the systems, whether it's boilers or whatever. But I think we may have to look, given the, the emerging technology and the costs related to that, to look at a different system being set up whereby um, you know, it may be that they, the, the, the uh, installers provide the equipment and, indeed, the energy supply, and we pay for that on a, on a rental basis rather than owning those systems, because at the moment the technology is not moving fast enough to bring it down to a comparable level for the vast majority of the public to afford that um, when they weigh it up against more conventional means of, of heat. So I think there has to be coordination in a number of areas, not just the financial aspects, in order to achieve uh, what we're striving for moving forward. Yeah, thanks very much, Jenny. It does sound like a huge challenge uh, to meet those 2030 targets. Uh, Adam, same question to you. Yeah, I'll try not to, to repeat um, anything before. Um, Inbras ran some projects in partnership, but. It, it depends kind of where we've got similar challenges world heritage um world heritage site uh, our old town is an obvious challenge our new town will be an obvious challenge i'm speaking to you in a um in a granite uh, home as well in um in leith uh, so there are significant challenges with the built environment but through cop we had a carbon um center which basically kind of took the city through a lot of the projects that were happening already, and some of the actions that would be needed, and some of it is um, is financially viable on its own terms, but a lot of it isn't, and it very much depends on what the building is and what the interventions are. Obviously, the more expensive the intervention, the better um, in terms of carbon emissions. So the trade-off does hit a balance point where it doesn't become financially viable in its own right, and it's the public. Um, First angle that will have to to pick up the tab for some of the hard to reach bits of that. The council is convening a heat and energy partnership. Um, we're pulling together council, NHS, Inver University, Scottish Water, Scottish Gas, um, the city region deal as well across the partnership. So we're trying to build that kind of partnership to build the the right kind of solutions. Um, and the heat and energy master plan is what, hopefully, when it comes out, and it's fully um, fledged, and the timeline for that is, uh, I think, by um, certainly the next few years. I think that would be published 22-23 um, is when we start that work properly. Um, when that's finalised, that will give us a very strong indication of what needs to be funded. Um, through public intervention and what can be funded through private intervention. But just to echo one of the points that was made by by Council Lang there, um, the skills element is is a crucial barrier to the stuff that stacks up financially in its own right. So the the industry, the sector has to change fundamentally. The gas boiler engineers will have to shift over and be able to, to transfer their enormous skills into the other things that we will need. And similarly, we'll need a lot more people um, doing a lot more interventions on roofs and windows and buildings in terms of insulation to, to drive that forward. So 
the skills element is the real barrier to the stuff that makes sense on its own right. And to echo Susan's last answer to a previous question, there is money within a city like Edinburgh to deliver a lot of that without public intervention. But for the stuff that doesn't stack up um, and that will need that kind of partnership wrap around support um, and finance, that that's where the public uh, focus, I think, needs to be on. Thanks very much, Adam. And Susan, same question to you. And uh, just a reminder that uh, we're slightly up against the clock, so apologies. Um, yeah, I'll keep it brief. I think um, I said in my, my previous answer, we've done a lot of feasibility work, um, extensive feasibility work in the Glasgow City region on building retrofit already. Um, that's all housing stock. Um, we are, um, and Jenny's alluded to this, we've done some pilots around, around the, how we would technically um, achieve the retrofit to, to passive house standard. Um, so, about, you know, as good as it gets, uh, really, um, of our pre-1919 tenement stock, uh, sandstone tenements, uh, you know, a brilliant urban housing model, but leak heat um, and uh, like nobody's business. Um, and that's that's where we have our biggest technical challenge um, and, and, you know, a heritage challenge as well. Um, obviously, at the same time as doing the retrofitting, we need to do that shift of people onto renewable heat sources as well. Um, there's no point in um, retrofitting homes if folk are still using gas boilers um, and, and indeed vice versa, putting folk onto you know, um, it, it, heat source pumps from, from the River Clyde uh, if uh, you know, half of that heat is disappearing out of uh, leaky roofs and windows. Um, so all of that work has to happen simultaneously. Um, you know, I'm very clear of the kind of scale that I've talked about. Scottish Government saying um, 30 million for a million homes. Glasgow City Region is nearly half of that, um, and, and a third of that cost. So we're we're way beyond that already, and we don't expect the Scottish Government to pay for it. Um, we have never expected the Scottish Government to pay for retrofitting. Um, this will be um, a partnership with uh, investors in the city, uh, both the retrofit and um, renewable heat source projects are part of our green print for investment. Um, so we, we've worked them up into investable propositions that we can talk to, um, say, uh, a pension fund about, uh, about getting that delivered. Now, that's not to say that the Scottish Government um, and, indeed, the UK Government, crucially, um, don't have a role in helping us to do this. A lot of that is actually in that in that feasibility, in the proof of concept, in the piloting of the particularly difficult bits. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think anyone can or should expect that the Scottish Government is single-handedly going to be able to pay for every, every home in Scotland to be retrofitted. This is going to need um, innovative finance models and partnerships, um, which, as I've said before, is going to take us into a new space and new ways of working um, that really very very few local authorities um, have, have been in before. Thanks very much, Susan. Uh, let me bring in Fiona Hislop. I, I know that Fiona has some questions in the finance area, so it's quite a good follow-up. Uh, Fiona, over to you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, the committee is interested in your work with partners and particularly in the relationship with uh, private sector and private sector investment. Um, I would firstly want to come to Adam McVeigh, uh, Council Leader for Edinburgh, then Council Leader Jenny Lang, and then Council Leader Susan Aitken. Adam, the Edinburgh City Council plan is quite explicit in, in this area, and with Edinburgh being an area of financial sector expertise, uh, what amount of private funding are you able to um, leverage in just now? What projects are you targeting, and what is success looking like, but what are the challenges? And then for Jenny, you've already talked about your relationship with BP and uh, the hydrogen sector. Are you doing anything similar in relation to leveraging and private sector funding as has been set out by Susan Aiken for, for Glasgow? And Susan, you very eloquently set out the scale and the ambition and the need to generate uh, investable propositions. Um, for you, it might be helpful if you could maybe share with us some of your uh, thinking behind uh, the experience of other countries or other cities that we can draw on, but I'm conscious of, of time on that as well. So I'm sure um, the convener, we might have to uh, ask for follow-up information if people are limited time -wise. So first of all, um, coming to Councillor uh, Adam McVeigh. Thanks very much. Um, 
really helpful question. I think as a real tangible that is happening now, um, I'll, I'll use a project which you'll be very familiar with, and it's a different space, I think, but um, the Grants and Waterfront project is a, a huge one, pulling in culture, education, but fundamentally thousands of homes for people in Edinburgh. And we've made sure that the standards that those homes are going to be built at is, is a high uh, standard. We're not leaving ourselves with the legacy of even more carbon to work through. But crucially, um, I think uh, one of the things that we're using to underpin that is a potential district heating model using the fourth. Um, we're not quite as lucky to have the volume of water that the Clyde has running through our city centre. The water leaf, unfortunately, doesn't quite have the the, uh, the flow through of, of water to give us that that scale and capacity to extract heat from it in the same way. But the fourth certainly does. Um, so one of the things that we're building into that project right now, and we will be absolutely relying on private sector investment becoming part of that. And there's been a huge amount of interest from those that are coming not only to build and invest, but build and invest in some of those basic infrastructure things as well, like um, district heating, renewable district heating from the fourth. So that's just one tangible example. Um, it's easier than you build. It is easier, but one of the things, and again, the other pertinent example that's coming to my head is in the south west, looking at powder, um, sorry, looking at uh, Miller Hill, and the waste to heat energy plant, and linking that in with um, using excess heat from that to heat new homes. We haven't quite got to the position, I don't think, where those renewable sources are connected into a transformation from gas to renewable heat within existing housing stock. And that's going to be the really quite difficult thing. But what we are doing now is proving concept, linking in the heat sources that are there to scale new development, pulling in that private sector investment to do it, and then hopefully building a district heating network which other existing um, streets and properties and homes can, can take advantage of and link into. So we're not quite in the position where the retrofit um, model, although what we are doing, as I said before, is pulling in funding that we've had from City Deal, for example, to try and up that skills uh, basis and try and strengthen the market and the industry to try and deliver that within the city. And that's entirely private sector led because the council is not developing retrofit companies, for example, but we are trying to make sure that market has enough skills in it that can uh, really fly and take advantage of the business that's, that's in the city, which is all driving down carbon emissions. Thank you. Um, Jenny? Thank you uh, for, for the question. As, as you mentioned there, um, we have uh, links with BP, both through our Memorandum of Understanding, um, where we're working with them like uh, you know they are with uh, cities around the world, Houston being another one, um, in relation to helping us to uh, meet our net zero targets within our own organisation and providing expertise and support in, that, in relation to that. But that's also led us on to um, you know, also appoint uh, them as a preferred bidder for our Hydrogen Hub Aberdeen a project and and that will look at scaling up the production of hydrogen um, at, for both transportation and indeed ultimately around that heat um, uh, aspects as well hydrogen for for heat both uh, commercial and residential and indeed the ultimate uh, production and hopefully export of hydrogen moving forward. But I think Aberdeen's got a long tradition of working with the private sector. We have a pri very private sector-led um, economy in Aberdeen. And uh, I mentioned about our city region deal being very much being based on that energy transition piece and indeed the, the technology and development of technology, um, which will help us around um, that net zero uh, targets that we've got, and I think we've shown from our city deal, which was in the region of 250 million from the two governments, we've managed to leverage in three times as much of that um, in connection with the projects through our city region deal, and um, that has been as a direct result of that strong public-private sector working. Now we've also got district heat networks within the city. 20 years ago. We set up an arm's length organisation, Aberdeen Heat and Power, um, in order to promote that within the city. And while it was set up 
as a not-for-profit um, organisation to help with fuel poverty and uh, reduce energy costs in the city. Um, it is also looking at how um, it can develop the, the systems that we have to meet the needs not just of our, our social tenants within the city, but also commercial um, uh, uh, customers and indeed uh, private sector owners as well. Um, and you know we've worked closely with them to develop those types of partnerships. So that's some of the work that's currently going on, public and private sector working together. And I think as we've all touched on today, it's going to be key that we get that private investment because we certainly cannot deliver uh, the net zero agenda uh, with public money alone. Can I just follow up that, Jenny? Is, do you think that the private sector, could, financial sector in particular, could be doing more in working with councils to get the investable propositions? Um, well, it's an interesting one. I always think that we can we can work closely. I mean, I, you, you may be aware that Aberdeen actually has a credit rating. We were the first local authority in Scotland to apply for that, and we issued a bond, and that has uh, actually allowed us to promote and uh, move forward with a, a large part of our capital programme. And one element of that was indeed the exhibition and conference centre, which we um, have developed in the city very much with environmental aspects attached to that. You know, we have an energy centre that's run by hydrogen and uh, fuelled by an AD plant. And it, it fuels not just that conference centre, but two hotels. And we think we can scale that up to uh, provide energy to the wider development that will take place on that site. So I think when you have propositions that are attractive, that look like they will pro produce a commercial return for investors, you can get that inward investment. And through the Scottish Cities Alliance, we've been working um, the seven cities across Scotland to try and make sure that we are presenting um, investor-ready projects that will attract that um, private sector investment and trying to give it as a proposition, as a collective, because I think that's what's important, is Scotland is, is a small place relatively in the scheme of things, and we have to go out with a, a joined-up approach, I think, in order to attract that inward investment into to cities like Aberdeen and, and Glasgow and Edinburgh and others. Um, in order to further the plans that we've got, not just around net zero, but other investment to uh, create that economic growth that we, we're all going to need moving forward, particularly Aberdeen as we transition from being an oil and gas city into uh, you know, renewable energy as well. Thank you. And coming to uh, Councillor Aiken, again, can we thank uh, Glasgow and the people of Glasgow and the hosting of COP? But is there anything uh, further to what you've already said extensively in private sector? Uh, investment that you can give us insight from from your international experience. Um, I think that final point that uh, Jenny made is an important one um, about understanding scale and what investors are looking for in terms of scale. Uh, in in Scotland, Glasgow, just about we have some projects actually not that many that are at the scale that these investors are looking for. They are looking for the tens of billions. They want massive projects which are for the long term as well. Um, but the, by and large, Scottish municipalities um, don't, aren't able to offer that on their own. Um, so the more that we are able to collaborate and to understand how to scale up investment and then to have these conversations uh, with the financial world, um, then the better positioned Scotland will be to, to reach our national targets. Um, and that is where Definitely, government support can come in um, around that capacity building, but also partnerships with organisations like that I've mentioned already, like Bloomberg, the Bloomberg Foundation, for example, who are really supportive of cities in growing capacity. The C40 Cities Network, um, which is is now chaired by um, Sadiq Khan, um, the, the Mayor of London, it's the kind of by and large mega cities of, of over a million, uh, but they've been very supportive and helpful with uh, for Glasgow. Um, invaluable support we've had from them. I think also um, understanding that while we're moving and having to move rapidly, so is the world of global finance. 
they're also having to change their mindsets and move. None of us are, are kind of doing this on our own. It's not like they're just going to stay over here and we have to do all the running. They're coming towards us. They're recognising that they have to change the way that they invest. They're becoming often more activist in their investments and actively seeking outcomes which they will be, they'll be able to say, yes, we have contributed towards um, tackling the climate emergency and to uh, delivering social goods and social benefits as well. Um, so I think there is, it, it, it's probably a much more long-term kind of collaborative relationship with investors than we might have been used to in the past. Um, we, we've all been, we've been very, very good in Scotland. Uh, and um, and you, you'll know this at bringing in uh, direct foreign investment into Scotland. In fact, we do, I think, uh, better than anywhere in the UK outside of London at bringing in um, foreign investment, whether that's for building hotels or office blocks or, or housing, all sorts of things. But to fund infrastructure is different, and that is where we do have learning um, and, and to understand what the commercial returns are on that and how we shape infrastructure interventions to make them uh, commercial propositions, while at the same time um, bringing the investors towards us um, and getting them signed up and aligned with us on delivering the outcomes that we want for our communities and for our citizens and obviously for the planet as well in terms of um, delivering carbon reduction. So there's there's a huge amount of learning still to be done. What I would say is that this whole area is moving very, very rapidly, um, really fast. Uh, what I talked about earlier, the UK Climate Cities Investment Commission, I mean that went, that was formed in like four months from early conversations between Glasgow and Bristol and those big global financial organisations, we then have an organisation emerging within four months. It's all moving very fast, and our understanding of it is moving very fast as well. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. And I think I'll be passing back now to the convener. We're very conscious of time. I was interested in your city's attitude to carbon offsetting in your own plans and otherwise. Perhaps we can ask um, your councils to, to follow up with that information. Uh, but I think, in, in uh, conscious of time, I think I'll hand back over to the convener. Uh, back to you, Dean. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Let me bring uh, Mark Ruskell now uh, to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. So, Mark, over to you. Yeah, thanks, um, convener, and uh, thanks for, for the contributions uh, we've already heard from this morning. Um, I wanted to focus you on transport. I mean, you've already mentioned some of the challenges around, um, you know, transport and its contribution to uh, to climate, you know, uh, emissions reduction. Um, in particular, I'm interested in what approaches you're taking to road traffic demand management. Do you have all the tools? In the box, uh, are you willing to use all the tools in the box to to drive down um, mileage, um, to, to particularly to meet the government's target for 2030? Um, could I could I start with um, with Adam actually on 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 this one? I mean, it, it's coming up uh, 20 years, I think, since the Edinburgh congestion charge referendum. Um, do you think the city would, if, if it had gone through, if it had been put in place, do you think the city would look different now? in terms of uh, traffic levels and investment infrastructure? Well, I think it would have inevitably looked different because it would have had a, an impact. I think it would have had an impact twofold. Um, one, I think it would have had a deterrent effect. I'm not necessarily advocating it, um, by the way. <laughs> and I point out I was, I think, about 13 years old at the time. So uh, certainly wasn't a, a stakeholder then. Um, but uh, I think it would have had a deterrent effect on traffic coming into the city and would have crucially provided the city with a revenue stream which it would have been able to invest in future um, future advancements. Edinburgh is in a, a quite strange and unique place in a Scottish context because obviously we have Lonian Buses that is a publicly owned bus company. Edinburgh Council owns 91% of the shares of that. The other shares held by the regional authorities in the Lothians um, at a fairly small rate, I have to say. Um, working to invest in public transport is not something we've actually been used to because we've had such a successful public transport company that actually Lothian Buses has been able to invest in its fleet, keep fleet fares low, 
and keep patronage very high. I should carry out all this with saying that this is pre-COVID, and obviously that's changed the dynamic slightly. But the mass transit necessity of Edinburgh as a growing city, you know, tens of thousands of more people. In fact, in the last 20 years, we're probably close to 100,000 people more living in Edinburgh um, than, than was the case then. Uh, so huge growth in the city. Mass transit is a thing that's needed now to cope with those really high capacity um, travel routes, and tram is the thing that does that best. Tram and active travel are the things that can really speed that up, and that complements and supports our uh, underpinning bus service, which carries so many people right across the city to, to destinations in a very different way to those key corridor mass transit routes. Um, and also very different to where people might walk or cycle. So um, I, I don't think we have the tools to get that change that we need right now. I think we need, um, one, a revenue stream to continue to invest in active travel and mass capacity public transport. And whether that is from a congestion charge or whether that is from uh, another form of charge, or indeed additional finance from central government, um, because it's at scale where the council can um, can pay for it on its own. Although I do point out that we are paying for a tram extension right now to New Haven um, as a as a council, and we're doing that on a business case which stacks up on its own right, and will not, um, I don't think, touch um, public finance because I think patrons will pay for the borrowing of it. But that is quite unique, and it's because it's going down a highly den an incredibly highly densely populated area. So patronage figures will support that. In other areas where we still have a huge amount of people making those journeys in the south of the city and indeed in the north, we need that um, that infrastructure. And I think it will be very difficult for patronage as a business case to make up that proportion on its own. So. Whether it's a congestion charge, whether it's a workplace parking levy, whether it's um, a, a recognition by central government that um, significant capital funding will be needed for these kind of projects, including things like additional cycling infrastructure um, and improved walking and mass capacity public transport of tram. Um, I'm not particularly fussy, uh, but I think the solution will need additional finance from one of those sources. Hmm. Do you see it as all carrot though, and, and no stick, or is there is there a balance here? Uh, there's I mean, definitely a balance. So Edinburgh's pursuing, sorry, yeah, yeah, um, Edinburgh's pursuing one of the most ambitious um, um, low emission zones in the entire country. We're trying to cover as much of our city centre as we can. Actually, I think if if all policy constraints were removed and we were able to craft that exactly how we wanted, I think we would have probably went for city wide. Low emission zone, but because of the way the policy is shaped, that's that's not workable um, for our city for a whole host of reasons. Um, but so so we are looking at policies to try and deter some of the high pollutant vehicles, and we will look at policies to make sure that vehicles can get access to everywhere in the city. Our plans for George Street, for example, one of our premier. Uh, streets in the city will have access for only deliveries and um, people with blue badges. Uh, so we're trying to decar um, a lot of our city centre. Our city centre transformation plan, as well, is built on putting the pedestrian at the absolute heart of those schemes and putting that space from car to people. So there's a huge number of things that that we're doing. Um, Road charging is one thing that could be done, but it needs to be done in conjunction, or, or parking charges, or some access charges, or whatever, however that's framed. Um, obviously, we have in our program right now workplace parking levy rather than a congestion charge, but fundamentally the policies would do the same thing in creating a financial deterrent and giving us a revenue stream to invest in those better alternatives like bus, tram, cycle, and walking. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Can I move on to uh, to Susan to get her reflections on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would agree with with a lot of what Adam said about the need to have. Well, first of all, that mass transit 
um, of whatever is the most suitable for the particular area um, is the answer and that we do need major investment in that. Uh, Glasgow, coming from a, a very different um, history from, a, from Edinburgh and Lothian, um, where historically our, our bus fleet was deregulated, um, and uh, to use your point about the combination of carrot and stick, we already have our city centre wide low emission zone in place. It is rolling out um, incrementally. It will be fully um, in place for, for all vehicles, including private cars, by the end of uh, 2023, um, and it has already had an impact. I, I think it is fair to say that there was historic underinvestment in the bus fleet in Glasgow by, um, well, the first bus of the main operator, uh, and that in comparison to other places, the quality of the bus fleet was extremely poor. Um, the bringing in the low emission zone. Um, but working in partnership with First Bus on that has transformed the bus fleet and, and, and uh, the investment that um, that combination of carrot and stick has uh, has has, um, has driven uh, has you know in a fairly short space of time the bus fleet in Glasgow is now unrecognisable. It is far far cleaner. It is much more modern. It is much more efficient. Um, so we've had the, the stick of the low emission zone, but also a carrot of working in partnership to um, have much more bus priority measures, for example, to try and I think think that First Bus rightly um, had a complaint that their journeys were often too long, there was too much congestion, and that that was something that was in the hands of the city to do and had never been addressed. Um, and and we have now started to address that. So a combination of things is improving that. But I agree, buses on their own are not going to be enough. They have to, it's going to have to be um, an integrated transport system. Um, we are approaching it on a regional basis. Um, we had uh, the recommendations um, and, and plans from the Connectivity Commission that reported um, gosh, nearly four years ago now. Um, and so we use, as shorthand, use the term metro for the combination of bus of our existing heavy rail system, which actually is. Superb is is one of the best outside London, uh, but is also absolutely at capacity. Um, the Cathcart Circle that runs literally right behind my house um, is the busiest commuter line in the UK at peak times outside of London. Pre-pandemic was, um, but also um, new light rail or tram on street to connect up. That is is a massive. Um, intervention. Uh, we have been working and talking to Transport Scotland about how we might progress that. We are not going to say much more about that just now because it is um, it's still ongoing. Um, and just in terms of Adam talked about road pricing, I would agree that it, it needs to be considered. The other thing I would add, though, for financing is, um, is land value capture. Uh, if we are investing in new modes of transport, and indeed through um, our city, deal, city region deal in Glasgow, huge amounts of investment in improving land and reclaiming um, post-industrial land that has been vacant and derelict for a long time. All of that public money is massively adding to the value of that land, um, and we do not have mechanisms at local level to then get the benefits of that to reinvest and continue to drive forward investment in whether it is in transport or continuing reclamation of um, of post-industrial vacant and derelict land. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another key mechanism that I think um, a revenue raising mechanism that I think would make a huge difference for local authorities, particularly cities city authorities, but that could be deployed on a regional basis, um, a travel to work area basis to um, to very very strong effect. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, and over to Jenny. Um, thank you. I mean, I I have to say I am sometimes envious of Edinburgh and Glasgow for the uh, you know the size of their public transport network and the variety of public transport that they have at their disposal compared to Aberdeen, because I think that does have a major impact on us, particularly as our. Um, we have quite a large travel to work area, and the reliability and efficiency and affordability of public transport has caused us difficulties, I think, in order to get that behavioural change of the public to get out of cars and onto public transport. As a local authority, like um, both Adam and Susan um, have done in their, their cities, we have we've done uh, similar things to try and make sure it is a bit of carrot and stick, I think. 
um, where we are uh, you know, bringing forward bus priority measures. We are looking to work again at a regional basis like others in order to get that um, you know, sort of integrated transport system that will meet the needs of the public. Um, but I do think that um, the fact uh, around, I mean, we've had a, a desire in Aberdeen try and set up a bus company of our own because like Glasgow we were deregulated and I think that's caused us incredible difficulties over recent years. Um, but the legislation really isn't there to allow us to do that. We have worked with uh, bus, the bus companies in the city and we do that to good effect I think through our uh, bus partnership and we've secured some additional funding that will allow us to look at a rapid transport system that we can bring forward but that will take us time. Um, and I do think that um, if there are more tools at local government disposal, then it helps us to make sure that we can prioritise some of these things. There has been a, a bit of a frustration um, because we've had some money as part of our city region deal around developing transport, particularly around rail. But so that's my fire alarm going off here. Um, but I don't think. You okay? I, but I, I don't think that um, we've diverted that funding to the correct areas because I think when we've seen investment in local train stations and areas, um, you know, um, surrounding Aberdeen, we've seen great uptake by the public. So I think some sort of, uh, you know, cross city uh, rail links, I think would, uh, you know, would benefit us greatly. But unfortunately, the money is being diverted elsewhere and not really being uh, channeled into the areas that I think would be most effective mm. for local areas. I mean, I think others are right around um, workplace levies and things like that, but I think it should be at the discretion of local government to determine whether, you know, what's the best things to bring in to benefit their local area um, that would provide the revenue that could be then invested in, uh, you know, other measures that would encourage that active travel mm. and indeed support that public transport network. Hmm. What what's the top thing that you're looking to come out of the STPR strategic transport projects? If you is it something like a mass transit system that presumably might might occur in Edinburgh and Glasgow in in the years ahead, or is it something else? Yeah, no, it, it is that. I mean, we've as, as I've mentioned before, we've um, we've you know prioritised uh, bus travel and things. We're looking at. Um, our, you know, a rapid transport system that we'd bring along our major travel corridors, um, and I think that is what is going to be required to meet the needs of the travelling public, um, because it is about it's about if it's about the efficiency and reliability of public transport. I think we have got, uh, you know, difficulties with the COVID situation and the impact that that's had to build back the confidence of the public to get onto public transport, but it is about us creating um, a, a system that is efficient, but also I think Susan touched on the uh, standards of the public transport is, is vitally important, and that is why we have invested heavily in our hydrogen bus fleet to provide uh, cleaner, uh, more up-to-date um, vehicles that will meet the needs of the travelling public. And we would look to see further investment in that and some of the other projects that we're bringing forward. Um, and you know, we had commitment from both governments to to look at that when our stag appraisals and things were done around some of these transport projects. And I would hope that they will uh, come to the table um, when we have the findings of that and make sure that uh, we're working together to try and deliver uh, that for the northeast of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So back to you, convener. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, next up is Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Liam Kerr. Over to you, Jackie, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Before I ask the, the panel uh, my couple of questions I've got, can I declare my interest because I'm still a serving councillor at Aberdeen City Council? Um, can I just thank the panel for, for coming along today? And I'll, I'll keep my questions brief because I'm, I'm noticing that we're getting very short for, for time. Um, can I can I ask the panel, it's in roundabout planning, um, within their local authorities, whether the Section 75 agreements are used to deliver infrastructure that is compatible with uh, and contributes to achieving the net zero? Um, can I go to Councillor Lang first, please? 
Thank you, uh, Jackie, for that question. Good, good to see you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we've always tried to make sure that um, if we have the legislation at our disposal, we can use Section 75 um, revenue. You will be aware that um, we did at one time attempt to set up a strategic transport fund uh, within the city, which we felt would, uh, was the best way in which we could utilise the developer contributions coming from the new developments within the city taking that into a pool uh, fund in effect, which we felt could then help us to deliver on some of the aspects that we've talked about there about transport systems across the city and make that more effective. Unfortunately, it was a, there was a legal challenge against that, which, uh, which we lost. And I think that was detrimental because I think um, if there is an opportunity around that planning system to make sure that the money that is coming in is spent in the right areas around the new infrastructure that allows us to uh, you know, bring forward um, and meet that net zero target. I think the difficulty around the planning um, system at the moment, again, is about the expertise and skills that we have within our own planning departments, particularly around that, that net zero and climate change agenda. And I think it is uh, necessary for us to make sure that we've got suitable training in there. So when our officers are looking at drawing up those Section 75 agreements, they have the suitable training and expertise in which to make sure uh, those uh, areas are covered and the money is directed to the, and channeled into the areas that we would like to see it spent. Can I also ask you, do you think that the current balance um, between using the Section 75 money, you know, between housing and infrastructure, it's currently, I think it's about 60-40. Do you think that's appropriate? An appropriate amount, um, I should say, sorry. Do, do you mean an appropriate, the, the split? Just uh, tell me that question again, Jackie. Sorry, I wasn't quite... The current clear. balance just now is that the Section 75 money is being used for like 60% goes on housing, 40% on infrastructure, is my understanding. Um, I was just wanting your opinion whether you, you think that that's appropriate or would you or would you change it in any way if you could? I think I think there needs to be a degree of flexibility. I mean, it, it depends, I suppose, on what that development is looking like um, and what the implications of that development will be. Um, you know, at, at the moment, when we have, um, you know, I, I think we're looking that we'll use the planning system moving forward um, to, you know, in, ensure that we're meeting those net zero targets and things. It's, it, it's much easier on new development to do that and make sure that the funding that's coming in is being spent in the right areas. When it's, um, when it's development that's already there and we're making changes to that, then obviously the implications around that would be different, I think, and the needs would be different. So um, I, I think there needs to be a degree of flexibility in relation to that. Um, but we, we have had, as I've mentioned, we've had difficulties in the past when we've looked to use that flexibility because the legislation isn't there to support it and that legal challenge is made and often the, the money is lost, which is detrimental to the local area. So I think we need to look at how that, that is shaped up in order to, to determine some of those aspects. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would, can I ask the same questions to Councillor uh, Aitken, please? Hi. Um, yeah, I think uh, the planning is, is a really interesting area. We have a slightly different approach in Glasgow. Section 75 isn't used in the same way as it is in other local authorities because um, where, where it's often used to drive um, and ensure that there is um, social rented homes or affordable homes built as part of developments, things often happen the other way around in Glasgow where we as the Strategic Housing Authority go in in partnership with a social landlord, first of all, um, into areas which are, you know, have previously been vacant and derelict land, for example, or um, are regeneration areas. And then we, we, we seek to attract private development off the back of our public sector, um, our, our public infrastructure um, in, investment in the first place. So, and that's to do with Glasgow's historic 
um, combination of the fact that we've got a huge amount of post-industrial vacant and derelict land, um, but also very large parts of the city where there is only um, there are only homes for social rent. Um, and so we, we don't need more homes for social rent. Um, it's more trying to get that kind of mixed tenure community um, and, and, um, and, and more uh, dynamism, I suppose, in, in, in some communities. Um, so we, we do use it in a slightly different way. Um, I think, again, it's getting past Section 75 is a tool, but um, it's having net zero hardwired into the planning system in the first place um, as, as, as a basic requirement, as a fundamental requirement, um, is, is where we need to be. I think um, the NP, National Planning Framework 4, which is obviously in draft form just now, is, is a massive opportunity for that, where we make that shift in Scotland, we take the next step that we already do very well in Scotland and planning around sustainability, but clearly we need to go further um, and we need to absolutely embed all development um, to be sustainable development and to be um, as close to net zero as possible. In Glasgow, we have, uh, unfortunately at the moment, quite a, a, a coming to the end of its, its time, but um, a, a slightly dated city development plan that we're still, still working to, but luckily about to replace. And that's certainly what we'll do at local level is seek to have that you know, so any developer coming into Glasgow and any development that's taking place at all, um, the starting point will be that it is as close to net zero as possible, um, and, and that where net zero can't be achieved, there has to be um, then offset and sequestration as part of that. Although I'm clear that um, that that is a um, that isn't that can't be the main vehicle. Uh, we we like it or not, in a city like Glasgow, we we have to decarbonise the hard way. Um, it it can all be done through offset and, and sequestration. Although there is definitely a role for that. Um, so for, for me, I think it is much more about how we um, yes use the tools that we have at our disposal just now, but make sure that as soon as possible there is a clear understanding um, by any developer going into any local authority in Scotland that there are um, there are consistent standards that they will be expected to um, comply with um, around delivering net zero projects and and net zero manufacturing um, uh, and, and supply chains and all of that as well, um, everything that contributes towards the development and its lifespan um, in the years ahead. And your views on the current balance of what the Section 75 is being used for at present? Is there anything else you'd like to see it being used for? Um, I mean, I think there are always uh, one of the, the things that we are really interested in looking at in Glasgow, we, we historically have a, a depopulated city centre, um, which um, one of the, you know, looking back, one of the, the more bizarre decisions made by um, city fathers past, uh, they were city fathers all in those days, um, which, which you know, has really come home to roost during the pandemic. And although we've had, um, and we have in place, um, a very clear ambitions to to repopulate and reurbanise um, our, our uh, city centre population. That didn't happen fast enough to build the resilience into our city centre that um, the pandemic has has revealed we really really need. Um, so I'm very keen that we uh, so a bit if we repopulate our city centre, we also have to have public services in our city centre, which at the moment we don't have so much of. So I think that's an area that we'll really want to look at in Glasgow, um, is um, having alongside um, a housing development in the city centre, a doctor's surgery, uh, because those kinds of things are lacking just now. But in the assumption that all of that is going to be decarbonised, um, and that is, it is going to be um, delivered sustainably, and that that's the starting point that is that it is going to be um, a, a net zero development, um, and, and that's uh, the, the expectation that everyone will be working from. Thank you, um, Councillor McVeigh. Would you um, like to to give me your thoughts, please? Yeah, uh, Edinburgh is again a very different market, I think, to, um, to to Glasgow. Our starting point, certainly for private uh, land, is usually developers coming in. Um, with a, a massive amount of expectation because they will have paid a lot for that land and they're looking for a return in a very hot market 
which obviously we're trying to build as much as we can um, new social homes and new affordable homes to try and bring those average rents down. So, but we have similar to Glasgow and probably most other places, our city plan is just about to be adopted, hopefully, and it puts carbon emissions and climate change at the absolute heart of it um, and getting to net zero. But Section 75 is quite a small bitty part of that. Um, it is nowhere near enough in Edinburgh to meet those infrastructure needs, and that's the infrastructure needs that are on the radar right now. The gap between what we expect from capital grant um, from Section 75 and the needs of the city going forward is, is in the hundreds of millions. So to put it into scale, Section 75 is absolutely never going to cover uh, that for us. It's also too inflexible. I think you were hinting there that there are other things that are not included in Section 75 that could and should be, and I think you're absolutely right on that. Um, culture, for example, is something that doesn't play a significant enough role where we're trying to build new communities that are genuine communities at scale, i.e. they don't have access to the other cultural institutions or whatever that are near uh, by another smaller brownfield sites, for example, and, and established communities. Um, so there's certainly a lack of flexibility, there's certainly a lack of scale, um, and it does not pay for everything. When the calculation is made, it's made in quite a bitty way. It's about pupil generation at schools and, and that sort of thing. They're quite it doesn't really quite capture the sum of its the sum of all its parts in the demands of the local authority. Land value uplift that was talked about earlier would be a far more effective way of us closing that infrastructure gap and being able to invest in some of the transformation to get us to net zero. So Section 75 is, is never really going to get us there, I don't think. Um, it's too kind of bitty a process, even if it was changed a little bit and a few more bells and whistles were added. Um, I don't think it can quite get us to where we need to get to. That land value capture is where I think we really need to harness that. And Edinburgh has made representations before on things like the first um, payment of new builds for the land value transaction um, tax, uh, because obviously the infrastructure that's been made, I think Susan made the point earlier about some of the public infrastructure that has been made for some of those developments, if we could capture the first payments of those in Edinburgh um, and then when it's resale, uh, when it's resold later on in the property's life, it's just taken as, as proper national taxation, um, those first payments would be really helpful to local authorities in being able to um, create a revenue stream to, to fund that infrastructure that we needed, both infrastructure to create a vibrant, sustainable community and also the infrastructure that we need to transform to net zero. Thank you. Um, back to you, convener. Okay, great, Jackie. Thank you very much. Let me bring in Liam Kerr. And if I could, because we're up against the clock, just remind uh, panel members if uh, you could provide succinct answers that would enable all the members to get through their questions. Uh, thank you very much. Liam Kerr, please. Very grateful, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, I'll put two questions in one and direct them to Jenny, Susan, and Adam in that order, please. Uh, you've all been clear that there's a great deal going on over some time in realising net zero, but to, uh, to use Jenny Lang's words at the start, this requires national coordination, support, and finance. Now, the Scottish Government draft budget cuts, depending on who you read, between about 300 and 400 million from council. Budget. So the first question then is, what are the implications of the draft budget for your council's delivery of your net zero ambitions? And then following from that, given the significant increase in funding that is ring fenced over the last eight years or so, does your local authority have sufficient flexibility in its budgets to invest in the transition? Uh, so Jenny Lang, first of all, please. Um, thanks very much. As, as you said in my opening remarks, I, I talked about the financial settlement for local government, and I think it's got a severe impact on, on what we can do moving forward. Um, I, I mentioned about the fact that I think there is um, a, you know, a lack of uh, skills and expertise within councils. I think we've got issues around the capacity for delivery because of cuts that we've had to make to our, our own organisations. We've had to look for savings around 
uh, you know, staffing levels within councils. I don't think we are um, unique in that. In that, I think that will be right across Scotland. And I think because of that, um, we are up against it in order to try and deliver on that net zero, both from a revenue perspective, but also from a capital perspective. You know, I mentioned earlier about how we've had to raise revenue in relation to capital projects. And uh, most of that has been done directly by the council. Um, you know, we have had very little funding in relation to our capital projects coming from national government, and I think that in itself causes us difficulties if we need that investment in projects moving forward. Now, the other aspect that I think we have difficulties with, and I, I touched on this around some of the retrofit projects. I spoke about the just transition funding that was, was announced. You know, there was £20 million announced um, in relation meant to be coming to, to Aberdeen and, and Murray. Um, but because we have very little detail about that, because we are being told that perhaps that can't be spent on um, projects that are already um, you know, you know, in, in the process of being delivered, are perhaps contained within our regional economic strategy or indeed our net zero plans that we've brought forward. They're looking for new uh, projects to come forward um, for us to for something different to be put on the table. It's very difficult for us to work those types of things up and provide the, the, the projects to meet that funding as often the pockets of funding that are made available are done on a short term basis. And I think we do have uh, as I've mentioned there, just the resource within councils and the expertise, and indeed the expertise out in the private sector, um, isn't there at the moment, I don't think, and a, a major national training programme will be required if we're to actually get people up to the, the required levels that we need. Um, because of that, I think uh, there will be difficulties ahead with local government um, playing their part in the delivery of the net zero um, goals that we're all striving for, and uh, you know we need to have that coordination. Because the other aspect is, you know, we're all out there because there's been lack of cohesion from this coming from the centre, developing our own carbon tools or policy positions or procurement services. That you know there's lack of uh, legislation around some of that, and our hands are tied. A lack of you know flexibility in relation to that, but it's also about us the research that's going on. All of this is happening in small pieces around the country. It needs to be coordinated properly so that we're not wasting the limited resource that we do have at our disposal um, moving forward. So I think there are a number of ways in which uh, local and national government can work together along with the private sector move things forward. But at the moment, the financial aspects are causing certainly our council difficulties and will do in the future um, for us to try and bring forward the projects that will be required to, to meet that net zero um, ambition. Very grateful. Susan Aitken, please. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I would go back, I would repeat the point that I made um, at the outset, which is we're not going to deliver net zero from local government revenue or, or capital budgets, for that matter. Um, it's net, the delivery of net zero is um, a, not just a national but a global scale uh, entire shift in the way that we organise economies and societies. Local government has an enormously important part to play in that, and certainly the existing budgets that we have um, and the existing way that we do things all have to be reconfigured um, so that every penny that we spend um, is is done in a way that is sustainable and that contributes to um, to net zero, contributes to us essentially running our economy, our society, our public services within planetary boundaries. But the interventions that we have to make and we have to deliver are of such a scale that they are beyond not just local authority budgets, they are beyond the Scottish Government's budget, they are beyond the Scottish Government's um, settlement. Um, the, we have to look to the UK Government and we have to look to the private sector. Now, I would also say the UK Government is massively underestimating the cost of this. 
Um, I mentioned already that the UK core cities and, and London alone um, are, the estimate is 200 billion um, of what it will cost to get us to net, de, to net zero within the next decade. Um, the Chancellor um, came up with 90, I think, in his last budget. Uh, the UK government clearly has far greater capacity to, to generate resource to literally print money um, it, that the Scottish government does not have. Uh, I would agree with a lot of what Jenny said around coordination, and I think there is um, a job for all of us to do to get our heads together and to understand what's being delivered at national level, what's being, what's the what's the role? It's not even a delivery. I'm I'm clear that I think the vast majority needs to be delivered at, lo at local level. What are the respective roles of of the UK government um, in this case? Uh, because they clearly have a, have, um, a very important role in this, because, as I say, they've got the purse strings uh, for, for the uh, interventions of the scale that are required. What's the role of the Scottish Government? What's the role of national agencies? What's the role of our regional economic partnerships, our city-region deals, our growth deals? What's the role of cities? What are the role of local authorities more generally? And I deliberately make a distinction between cities and local authorities, because I think, as we, we've all said um, in this session, cities at least in this crucial next decade, are the key. We need to be out there in front uh, delivering on this. Um, there, there are issues definitely about capacity um, and about understanding what do we need at local level in terms of our skills, in terms of our capacity for in, engaging with the private sector at the level that we need to, which, as I've said, um, is a new space for all of us, um, where you know even those of us who, who are you know, very good at inward investment, um, and we've all touched on Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen. All have our successes to point to in that. This is a, this is on a different scale and at a different pace. And I think there is a job for us to do collectively in partnership with government. Um, I think COSLA has a big role to do in this, where we collectively understand what our roles are, what capacity do we need to deliver this. We don't have a lot of time. It's not a lot. Can't be a long conversation. It needs to be a quick conversation because. 2030 isn't that far away, um, but I, I believe that working together collectively, we can come to a clear understanding what are each of our roles, um, what, what capacity do we need, what, what tools and resources do we need, and then get out there um, and, and do it, um, and do it collectively as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, Adam McVeigh, if you wouldn't mind, and, uh, just if it helps, the, the, the question that I asked was about the implications of the draft budget for the Council's delivery of net zero ambitions, uh, just if that's a useful reminder. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, to, to be clear, our policy agenda and our um, prospectus and our carbon strategy is not going to be deviated by the, the most recent um, budget announcement. You will have seen from our um, our current strategy that that it does point out quite a number of things which are relevant to the Scottish budget, i.e., the bus infrastructure fund, things like that that we're looking to take advantage of, and, and certainly those things are helpful in driving forward the actions that we're relevant for. Um, I would echo one of the points in relation to the resource planning. So um, it is a challenge with a city like Edinburgh with 62,000 EU nationals. We have Brexit, which has been an incredible thing to negotiate, and I'm not saying Edinburgh had to negotiate that any more than anybody else has. That's been a huge challenge. COVID has obviously been a dominating force for the last two years, and we're trying to deal with the negotiation of how we get our economies and our cities to a net zero position in a very short time scale, only another nine years, essentially, or nine years. So all of this in terms of resource planning is, is difficult. Now, we'll maintain our um, planning resource within the senior management team, uh, but you know my time as council leader, the time of my chief executive, the time of my chief of planning uh, and um, finance head, and, and all those other senior people, every moment that they spend on trying to find a budget saving within the organisation is a moment not spent um, trying to, to drive forward those other parts of the agenda that are so important. I would say, though, one thing which, in, in sort of counter to that, and it's pertinent in not that many areas, but in a few, um, Edinburgh is also working with police, NHS, a whole host of other public and private, well, mainly public 
um, sector providers, but some other um, providers as well, about co-location of assets. Now, that is an example where it will drive budget savings and it will also reduce the collective carbon footprint of the public sector within our cities and free up useful money that we can then use to retrofit the other public buildings that are being retained. So there are some solutions of collaboration that the financial squeeze is actually providing an opportunity to encourage partners to work together and come up with financial savings and carbon savings at the same time. But there are a few examples that I can point to where that is driving that kind of success, but, but it is encouraging some of that collaboration. Fundamentally, though, we all acknowledge, I think, on this call setting on the, on the panel that you've heard today, that cities are very well placed to lead that engagement, the partnership, and pull together the right projects, whether they're public sector or private sector, to drive forward the change that we need. And it's worth saying that it's within our, it's left to us as councils to resource that. Um, and in Edinburgh, we've certainly prioritised it and tried to resource it as best we can. But um, more flexibility and more resource for that strategic planning and, um, and delivery in the city would obviously be incredibly welcome. Thank you all. I, I have one small extra question, which I'll direct to, to Jenny Lang, based on something that you said there. Uh, Jenny, you mentioned um, the just transition from oil and gas as being key. Uh, to, to net zero, to get into net zero. Uh, and you also mentioned this just transition fund and 20 million in the budget, and you suggested that there was a, a lack of detail around that. Uh, can you help the committee understand how much engagement has the Scottish Government had with you on this just transition fund? And specifically, when you say there are no details, uh, have the Scottish Government been engaging with you to find out what's going to work in the North East and what the Council can be doing to contribute to that? Just transition, Jenny Lang. Thank you. Um, we obviously had the announcement um, at, at, uh, by uh, the cabinet secretary around that twenty million, and since then, um, our officers have had very early um, discussions um, with uh, government officials, but the, there is a, a lack of detail around what that money can be spent on. Uh, you know what projects uh, you know may be uh, you know be, may actually be qualify for the funding that's there, and I think the difficulty that we have is when when big announcements are made, they raise expectations both with business and and uh, st economic stakeholders within the region about that money coming forward, and there are, does appear to have been in that initial discussions. Um, mention that you know perhaps projects that we feel may be you know beneficial that could be brought forward at pace wouldn't actually um, you know qualify for that money. They are looking for for new ideas and uh, you know for plans to be drawn up. Well, all of that takes time, and I think what we understand in the northeast is that just transition. I, in my opening remarks, I mentioned about the number of people. That we have who are dependent on the oil and gas sector within this region. And with the best will in the world, I've talked about you know, our, our hydrogen projects and things moving forward. Even if we are successful in bringing that to fruition, the plans that we've got by 2030, it will provide 700 jobs. We've got in the region of 70,000 people currently that are dependent on oil and gas. So I think on that basis, we realise that. We need to make sure that that money is going out to and being channeled to the areas that are required in order to, to make sure that we do not reach that cliff edge in the North East, um, where uh, you know, we, we move away from those fossil fuels without anything um, to provide employment and economic uh, growth for this area moving forward. And That is my concern, is that big announcements are made, but there is not that coordination and cooperation between local and uh, national government to actually uh, make the, the, the spending of that finance beneficial for, for the people and businesses in, in the north east of Scotland. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Liam. Let me bring in Natalie Dawn to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, Natalie, over to you. Hi all. Um, thank you, convener, and uh, thank you to the panel for your comments so far. They've been really, really useful. 
Um, I just want to touch on some issues this morning around waste and circular economy. It hasn't been touched on too much already. Um, given that 3% of Scotland's total emissions came from waste and circular economy in 2019, strategies around this, I think, are going to be really key going forward. So I know a few of you have already mentioned collaboration with local people, and while not solely dependent on this, I do think there is a need for the public to really buy into, understand and support new practices and change attitudes in terms of their waste and recycling and a circular economy. So can I ask the panel, what are the main challenges and opportunities in your area in reducing emissions from waste management and meeting forthcoming 2025 waste and recycling targets? And in what circumstances do you consider the energy from waste infrastructure will be compatible with your net zero target? And I'm also just going to ask the second question, and, and you can take them in turn if that's all right. Um, what is being pursued in your area to support the development of, of a circular economy, and who are the key partners involved in that? Are innovative local economic models being developed and supported in your area around, for example, reducing waste, reuse and repair, and recycling? And if I could come to Councillor Aitken, uh, then Councillor Lang, then Councillor McVeigh, please. Um, thanks. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important question, and there's there's a number of elements in there which I'll, I'll try and tease out as quickly as possible. So on on circular economy, um, I'm glad to say Glasgow is seen uh, internationally as as a leader on this. Um, we've been doing work for a number of years, uh, deliberately led by business. Um, so so although the council is very closely involved, um, and we worked very closely with our chamber of commerce, who've been a key player. Um, to develop our, our circular economy route map um, in Glasgow, which we have got uh, as many partners as possible signed up to, um, and which we delivered through the Sustainable Glasgow Partnership that I spoke about earlier. Uh, the business and uh, manufacturing, in particular, I suppose, has been uh, involved in the development of the circular economy right from the outset. Um, we have done a lot more work recently um, with the support of C40 cities. Um, and uh, we've we've joined their um, a, a <clears throat> network of cities uh, where uh, with Amsterdam is probably the best known example, which use uh, the the donut model, um, a, a economic model of, um, of of working within having having everything in your city work within planetary boundaries, um, and obviously. The circular economy is a huge part of that. In, in some ways, the, the donut model is um, the next step in, in expressing how this, the circular economy would work, taking it the next step further. Um, so we have uh, joined that, that network of uh, cities who are actively implementing uh, the donut model, um, which is the Professor Kate Reworth's uh, model of, um, of, of uh, planetary boundaries and, and kind of social uh, boundaries and making sure that everything everything that you do happens in that kind of the sweet spot um, between the the inside and the outside of the donut. Um, so we're we're doing a lot of work on this, and, and we were invited by C40 Cities to be part of that because we're <laughs> recognised um, as having made a lot of progress on it. Having said that, in terms of our own waste management, we have a huge amount to do in Glasgow. Uh, we have are way behind. Um, on uh, recycling rates, um, historically they are they're woeful. I have to say they've, they've not been good at all. Now we're starting to see a difference, um, and we've made some changes to um, the, to, to the management of waste services um, in recent years. Um, and Adam was talking earlier about the how you know the, some some of these are difficult political decisions um, because not everyone likes it when you know they don't like an impingement on either their, their, their lifestyle, the lifestyle they've come to expect, or the way that public services are delivered. But we are going to have to make those changes. Uh, we have no choice but to take on some of these challenge, challenging decisions. So we in Glasgow actually very belatedly did what a lot of local authorities, I think most local authorities in Scotland have already done, which was reduce the number of, um, of general waste pickups. Um, we went from, from a two-weekly to a three-weekly pickup. Um, and, and it wasn't popular. There was quite a lot of kickback against that. However, we have started to see the change. So we've seen something like a 12% uplift 
um, in recycled material coming through. Um, so we can we can see the difference that that's making, and I think that we're able to go back to folk to to, to residents and see. This is making a difference. It is helping us all to consume less by literally showing you how much you're throwing out. It makes you think more about it. It makes you think more carefully about what goes in your recycling bin rather than just automatically chucking it in the general waste. Um, so there is there, there's a huge piece of work to be done there, and of course that is one of our core public services. And it comes back to this thing about. Part, you know, it's part and parcel of just the way that we work, the way that we operate as local authorities. We have to think about what we do in our day to day, um, and how we organise um, and manage and, and transform that in order to make that sustainable, in order to have that aligned with our net zero plans, um, and, and to support net zero delivery. And a lot of it is very, very challenging, um, and it is. A difficult conversation to have with local people, but it is absolutely essential. And I think th so. We ha we have a new, um, relatively new, um, kind of waste management uh, strategy for the entire city, which uh, uh, which we're calling a resource strategy, um, trying to make people think about this. This is all planetary resource, um, and trying to to have that in the round, and and so that we all think collectively about. What we consume, um, and then what comes out the other end, and in the context of what we throw away, what we recycle, uh, what we reuse. Um, alongside that, uh, and, and just briefly, um, Constantine, you, you talked about uh, reuse, and um, that is an enormously important part of our um, our circular economy approach. We are supporting a development of um, of, of essentially a network of reuse. Sites across the city. Um, there's there's been some fantastic work done uh, with uh, old IT equipment uh, being uh, repurposed and reused and, and um, used to, to um, help deal with the, um, the the digital gap as well in the city. Um, and we're looking at the potential of um, a circular economy village um, being being located in, in one of the forthcoming developments. That's a very early stage just now, um, a very early stage of discussion. We're working very closely with Zero Waste Scotland um, on how we might deliver that um, alongside the, the businesses, the Chamber of Commerce, for example, who are already really in closely involved in, in our thinking around circular economy and the donut model in Glasgow. Um, so I realise that was a bit of a rush through, but I hope that gives you a bit of a, a picture of where we are, but more importantly, where we're trying to get to in this. There's a lot of work to do, and it is very challenging, but I think that we've got a clear path ahead of us. The difficult bit is, is I suppose, bringing people along with us and helping them to understand why the way that public services have been delivered in the past can't always be the way that they're going to be in future um, if, if we're going to do our bit to um, tackle the climate emergency. Hi, um, thank you, Natalie. I'm conscious of, of, of time as well. Um, like Glasgow, um, Aberdeen has been working closely with our Chamber of Commerce around um, the Circular Northeast project that we've got in relation to uh, the circular economy. And I mentioned at the beginning that we um, were working on that route map, and we're about to publish that in, the, in just in a few weeks' time. And the project manager from that. Uh, from Grampian Chamber of Commerce has actually been the theme lead around our net zero Aberdeen circular economy strategy that will come forward as part of that route map, which uh, designates some of the, the projects and things that we're involved in. I'll not go into detail because I, I, I don't think we have got the time today, but that, that gives you a flavour of what we're doing around that with uh, that, that partnership working. Like uh, Susan's mentioned there, um, you know, within our own organisation and the, you know, dealing with waste within our local authority, we've been very proactive. I think in recent years, we opened a new recycling centre um, in the city uh, just about maybe about five years ago now, um, where that is where we we pick the waste up um, at curbside and it's sorted. Uh, multiple, uh, you know, different types of waste is sorted in that uh, new facility, and that has definitely helped us to increase the the levels of recycling that's happening within the city itself. 
um, which you know I think is pleasing. And we also, you know, around garden waste and things like that, we have separate collections for that, which I have to say that the, the public have bought into in a big way. Um, around that, you mentioned specifically about the energy from waste, and we do have a new facility which will open um, later this year in the city. Now, that's a collaboration between three local authorities, uh, Aberdeenshire, Murray, and ourselves, and indeed Suez, um, where we will look to that residual waste that we have left over will go to the energy from waste plant rather than going to landfill. But it was important to us to make sure that the energy that was being produced by that facility was used to best effect in the city. That's why we've located it next to one of our regeneration areas where we had the highest levels of fuel poverty probably in the city, so that we can make sure that that uh, and we are you know in the process of uh, pulling together that heat network which will take the the residual heat and uh, from that facility and actually um, allow us to provide it to the, the homes in that regenerative phase of that network um, to lower their uh, energy costs and help with that fuel poverty agenda. But we also hope that we can roll that out um, across a wider area to take in both residential and commercial properties moving forward. So that's some of the initiatives that we are Currently, got ongoing in the city, but like Susan says, um, you know, we we are always striving to do better, and uh, I hope that that strategy that will come forward in the next few weeks will help us to do that. Both uh, public and private sectors working together to get that circular economy really embedded within in the city. And uh, the other aspect I think that Susan had touched on was the reuse aspect, and we've done a. a, a a work around some of that. Again, it's been around that old IT equipment and things. Um, it's very pertinent at the moment, I think, with the, the COVID situation and, and the need for IT equipment to allow people to work more flexibly and uh, and from different uh, from home and, and various other things. But we've been doing that work through our responsible business uh, links uh, through community planning, to make sure that we're tying up. Um, businesses along with communities to ensure that we get the reuse of uh, equipment and, and other things uh, that businesses have, and we get that uh, being utilised to best effect within our local communities. So that's just a few of the um, uh, strands of work that are ongoing in, in Aberdeen City in relation to, to the circular economy. Thank you. Just I'll try not to repeat that much of what my colleagues have, have said, because in Edinburgh, similarly, um, the Chamber of Commerce leads the circular economy work. It's really important that business leads this. Um, to go right to your, your final part of your question, yes, I think um, energy from waste is compatible with getting to net zero by that 2030 landscape. I think the carbon emissions from that versus the carbon emissions from landfill for these modern um, clean facilities are are good. They are not zero carbon, though, and so it does give you questions, residual questions about offsetting and what you do with the, the residual. But the partnership approach in Edinburgh has been huge. Partner with Zero Waste Scotland, um, partnering with Evoc, as I said earlier, on now Our Future Edinburgh uh, project to really engage with citizens about that change that we'll need, um, and engaging with partners like the Edinburgh Remakery that. Take things like laptops and redo them, and Hoover's, and a whole host of other things to, to get that reuse agenda um, going uh, strong as well. Um, I, I would say, just going back to the, the difficulty of some of this, Edinburgh's just got, I think, seven point seven million pounds um, in Scottish government support for our uh, communal waste review, um, and that's tenements. You know, we're a city with a lot of tenements, a lot of on-street. Bins, um, they are not the prettiest things in the world, as MSPs will know walking around the city of Edinburgh. That money is part of a bigger programme to really change the landscape of that, really shift from you'll see the big black containers that are general waste and shift that towards a much um, bigger capacity of local recycling facilities for people that live in tenements. Because the main complaint that we've been getting for years is that um, there's people are feeling forced to put more into landfill than otherwise would because our local recycling facilities are just not adequate and they don't have the means and they don't have cars to get to local recycling centres. 
um, especially in areas like like I represent Leith, where car ownership is less than 50 per cent. Um, and there's obviously a huge crossover between those that don't have cars and those that live in tenements, where there's not that much on-street parking. I would say, though, as part of that scheme, we are also looking at putting in that kind of recycling infrastructure in our city centre. And it is a World Heritage Site, and it's, there's no getting away from it. There's an element of difficulty saying to people who previously had golf-proof sacks um, as a model of, of working, but the recycling rate was appalling in that community. We have let that community down by not providing the facilities in our city centre that, that they need, with a huge amount of challenge. But bringing in that change is controversial and it's difficult. So it's really important that we do reduce as much as we possibly can, that we recycle as much as we can, and we reuse as much as we can. But in getting there, some of the solutions are quite difficult. And obviously, one thing that we're all working to is a recycling rate, which is improving in Edinburgh, similar to Glasgow. It's been really difficult to get a recycling rate up to where it needs to, to get. But the overall tonnage is still falling, so there are there's good news in the reuse agenda and in the reduce agenda, but that's not quite reflected in the overall percentage recycling rate. So we're doing all we can on those three agendas, but it is quite difficult um, to drive that change. But it does need a lot of political will uh, to force it through, because otherwise communities will be let down and they won't have the facilities that they need. And to, to kind of circle back to the punchline question, which was around heat from um, energy from uh, from waste, the amount that we send to those sorts of plants, even though they are modern and um, much cleaner than the alternative of, of landfill, um, we do need to reduce as much as we possibly can going to those facilities. So it's great that we have them. I think they are compatible with our net zero agenda, but we still need to be mindful that they are not just a, a place that can deal with absolutely everything. And there's no need to, to embrace the, the reduce, reuse, and recycle agenda. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Natalie. And let, let me bring in Monica Lennon uh, for the last line of questions. Monica, over to you. Thank you, convener. Um, I think I'll stick with this topic because it is a really important one, and the committee is keen for this inquiry to find out how councils are working with partners to promote recycling and that shift to circular economy. I think we've heard from our leaders, council leaders today that the, the business sector is really important. Um, I was struck by what Councillor Aitken said about Glasgow being seen as a, a leader on circular economy. Um, not to sound too negative here, but I think for the reality check, Scottish household waste recycling rates are currently the worst in the UK, and only 42 per cent of household waste uh, was recycled in 2020. Glasgow sits pretty much at the bottom of the league table. So I'm interested to hear what lessons are, are being taken from other parts of the UK. And in a previous session, we heard from Zero Waste Scotland that Scotland's waste system, to a certain extent, is fragmented. So what are councils doing to share uh, best practice with one another and to look at some of these challenges? Um, so I think we've heard already why the rates um, have been low and what needs to change. Um, so I maybe can get each of you to talk about a little more about your own experience. but. If I can also ask that issue about energy from waste facilities and incinerators in particular, we did hear from Zero Waste Scotland that incineration is not low carbon um, and that we are too reliant on incineration and landfill. So, do each of you and your councils um, support a moratorium and potential ban on incinerators? And is that something that you're engaging? Um, locally on in terms of consultation with communities. Um, so can maybe start with um, Susan Aitken, first of all, and I'll come to um, Adam McVeigh. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely clear that we, we have a, a, a gulf at the moment between ambition and uh, achievement in terms of the circular economy in Glasgow. Uh, we are, you know, and it, it's one of the reasons why we're working with C40 cities and, and getting that learning not just from other cities in the UK, but from places like Amsterdam, Barcelona, and elsewhere, um, who have have really, you know, made a lot of progress on this. Um, obviously, Scandinavian cities are, um, are are very good at this as well. Where interestingly, and I'll come back to the waste energy. Waste energy is 
standard and has been for a long time with them um you know a big part of their uh, their way of working um and and they are by and large considerably ahead of us on uh, on net zero um or on the journey to net zero um but yeah, no, we, we have, um, and Adam touched on some of the, the challenges that they've got around the built environment in Edinburgh, which are replicated in Glasgow. Uh, you know, high, huge numbers of tenements, over 70,000, 70% of the population of Glasgow live in flats. Um, and, and, you know, the challenge around uh, the collection and management of waste and the, giving people the opportunities to recycle um, in the way that Adam talked about are, um, I, I guess they are, they are definitely challenges, and they need innovative solutions. Um, so we are very clear that we know what the ambition is, um, how we then get there. Um, there. There are a number of challenges on the way, but working in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland, for example, we can start to break those down, start to um, look at what is standing in the way of people um, recycling, um, of, and, and also of kind of overconsumption, I suppose, in, in, in some things. Um, you know, we often we don't talk enough about the reduce part at the beginning of reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I thought I remember going into COP26 when the Prime Minister had said um, that the you know the three big issues uh, that the UK were going to take, was going to focus on, um, and I, I didn't disagree with them at all. Were coal, cars, and cash. Although I would have said that coal should have been fossil fuels altogether, but it wouldn't have given them the um, alliteration. The, the other big alliteration he was missing was was consumption, because consumption, of course, is is at the heart of all of it, and and we do need to address that, um, and that needs to be part of um of, of and, and it's what we're doing in Glasgow is I suppose going right back to basics. Before you even get to the recycle bit, how do you reduce the consumption in the first place? And that's a difficult conversation to have in a city where a lot of people live in poverty um, or, or you know live with um financial stress. Um, and I've always been very clear that a lot of the discussions around net zero are about people changing their lifestyle. And I'm not going to be doing that with people who have their choices constricted by poverty. I think you know that it's a different kind of approach there. It is about opportunities. It's about creating systems that allow people and enable people to live more sustainably. Um, on waste to energy, uh, I, I, and my apologies to, to Natalie Dawn. I, I, I forgot um, to pick up on the, that bit in my answer to her. We have a plant in Glasgow already there, um, which is um, not incineration it involves an element of incineration but it's it's contained um, and and um, it's a uh, uh, pyrolyzer i think is what they call it uh, i think that's the word um and uh, with with the kind of full um range of processes that deal with different kinds of waste in different kind of ways so we have considerably reduced our, our landfill as a result of that um, that was um, it was underway. It took a, it was a very very challenging capital project. It was underway for years and years before, and it opened very very late. Um, and it, it's missing the bit that Jenny talked about, which is the crucial bit that we are putting energy now into the grid from it, but it's not going into homes because when it was built, they didn't build the the heat network part of it. So that's our next task. Is to get that energy directly into homes rather than, than just into the grid and get local benefit. And we think that there's quite a considerable area, um, neighbourhoods of the city around Pomody, the Gorbals, Govan Hill, that would, would benefit from that. Um, and indeed, it's one of the projects that's in, in the investment green print. Um, we're not expecting to build another one of those because we've already got one in the city. Um, I, I would echo what Adam said. We know that it isn't perfect. We know that it is a creator of carbon. It is, it is much better than sending stuff to landfill, and it has reduced um, our landfill impact in the city, definitely. But it is not a solution on its own, and you have to take those steps back. Um, you can't just say, um, oh, great, we've got that facility now. We'll just throw everything in the one bin and send it to that facility. Um, and I think there was, when that was planned for being built, I think that maybe there was a view that that could happen. That could somehow that will be the solution, and we'll just send everything there. Clearly, that can't be the case. Um, we still need to go back and create the facilities for people to recycle, create the facilities and the opportunities for people to reuse, and crucially, have what needs to be 
a, a society-wide conversation about um, rates of consumption and, and reducing how much we consume and how much we throw out in the first place, even if it is recycling, because recycling itself uses energy, of course. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think any of us are under the illusion that there are um, very easy or quick answers to this. <coughs> Excuse me. It is a long term. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'll just leave it there. I'll, I'll let you get some, some water. Before I move on then to um, to Adam and Jenny, um, if, if Susan can recover her voice, just got a brief supplementary for Susan, and the others can hopefully pick it up because we are trying to get into real granular examples, you know, the practical decisions that people make every day. Um, last year, I did some research looking at um, the amount of nappies that go to landfill in Scotland. I think it's 160 million nappies every single year, but only five local authorities in Scotland out of 32 have a real nappy initiative. I think North Ayrshire Council has the, really sort of the best example of that. Is that the kind of um, scheme that, you know, Glasgow City Council and others should be looking at, um, because we know that nappies are expensive, but to buy, you know, cloth nappies can be quite pricey. Um, is that something that is discussed through your networks, like in Cosla, because that could make a real practical difference? I don't know if Susan's able to speak right now, but if so, I'll back that back to you. Yeah, sorry, apologies for that. I'm at the tail end of a cold. Um, <clears throat> Um, the short answer is yes, we do need to look at all of these things. As I say, it is about <clears throat> creating systems and opportunities uh, for everyone to reduce their consumption um, and to, uh, to, to live in a sustainable way as much as possible. And we need to look at our entire systems across the board and what we're able to offer there. Um, I know that the, um, there are one of the, the boards in COSLA, the Environment and Economy Board, there's definitely sharing of best practice goes on there. Different local authorities are at different places. Some of them will have, you know, one project. Somebody else will have another kind of project. Um, what we all, what we need to do is get to a point where we are consistently all delivering these services. Some of them might be on a regional basis. So some of them might be shared between local authorities. Um, I think particularly where there are smaller authorities uh, co-located together, that that's something. This should definitely be looked at, uh, but yes, I mean the short answer is we we need to look at every single opportunity um, and and every single uh, bit of best practice that's out there. Um, it's always the case, um, sadly, that you know, and it's it's not that uh, well, you know, it's it's an inevitable outcome in some ways of um, of local government and local responsibility that we we make local democratic decisions and prioritise different things at different times. Um, but getting to net zero and meeting the national targets and indeed global targets um, of you know, the, the, uh, what we need to do to, um, to keep 1.5 alive uh, is, is going to require much more coordination than perhaps we have done in the past. Um, and I do think that, like I said previously, I think COSLA and, and organisations like Scottish Cities Alliance have got a really important role in helping us to coordinate. And I think, as Adam has touched on, perhaps sometimes take that step back from the day-to-day -day pressures, and which are always there in local government. And you're constantly focused on the operational thing um, to, to take that strategic overview on a national basis, along with all the partners that we require to deliver this. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. I'm going to pass back to the convener. I'm getting a message that we're running out of time. Um, I don't know if I can hear from Councillor McVeigh and Councillor Lang, but if not, perhaps they could follow up in writing any points that need to be covered. But I'll pass back to, to you, convener. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Monica. Sorry, we are very much running behind schedule. Um, if the uh, if Councillor McVeigh and Lang could follow up. Uh, with Monica Lennon's questions in writing to the committee, that would be very much appreciated. And uh, that certainly brings us to the end of our allotted time. Uh, let me thank our panel members for taking part and helping us set the scene for this very important inquiry. We've uh, obviously covered a huge amount of ground this morning, so your time is very much appreciated. And we will no doubt uh, be in touch with you as this inquiry progresses. 
Um, I'll now suspend the meeting briefly for a changeover of panel. Thank you once again. Welcome back. I now welcome our second panel uh, of witnesses for this meeting of the committee, comprising representatives of two predominantly rural councils, Councillor Margaret Davidson, Council Leader Highland Council, and Simon Fieldhouse, Environment Manager, Dumfries and Galloway Council. Thank you both for joining us today, and apologies that we are running late this morning. We will move straight to questions, and I will begin. And if you had the chance to look at panel one, um, I have the same two introductory questions as set out in panel one. The first relates to evidence given by the UK Climate Change Committee uh, when they shared concerns about whether local government has the necessary resources, capacity, budget, expertise and powers to deliver everything that is required in the context of the transition to net zero. Do you share some of these concerns about local government capacity and resource? And if you do, it would be very helpful for the committee if you could explain what particular areas you face the greatest challenges in. And let me start with Margaret Davidson and then hand over to Simon Fieldhouse. Margaret, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, convener, um, uh, and, and I will do my best to crack on. Though, uh, can I just make one comment before we start? Um, uh, while we might be running late, I have no problem with that because actually this morning's session was really interesting, and I listened to it all. Uh, and um, and I'm sure, like uh, like the panel, uh, I gained a lot of knowledge and insight for, from it. So um, thank you for the ability to do that. Now, going back to uh, the question you, you, you've set me, um, uh, I think what, what you see is there's absolutely nothing wrong with our national ambitions. They're good. Uh, they're, they're unambiguous. We, we, uh, they're very clear about what we do. But we haven't got that strategy at local level. And it's a real gap, it's a real gap because um, uh, we're all getting on as best we can. We all realize this is going to be uh, something of a scale and uh, speed that we've never dealt with before. So what I think is uh, missing is what Jenny Ling articulated really well. It's about the resource within local government to respond to this as best we can. And again, quoting another one of my colleagues, Adam, he said, every minute that we spend worrying about budgets uh, and this year's budget is a minute not spent doing the really vital uh, work that we need to do. Uh, and that's where we are right now uh, as we speak that. So it is. It is about um, it is about having the capacity to deliver. There is, of course, uh, I mean, uh, you think of Inverness as a city in the Highlands, but um, uh, most of our population lives outside the city. Very small towns, lots of villages, rural scattered communities. The cost of doing everything is always much higher, and it's much higher to get. Um, uh, it's more difficult to get uh, our senior officers on occasions and managers to prioritise um, thinking about lowering their carbon footprint uh, at the same time as trying to make ends meet and fill the potholes, keep the schools open and all the rest of it. The other big gap we have, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll just make a quick comment on how the government can help us, but the, the, the other big gap is around training and employability. We have astonishing prospects in Highland, astonishing uh, um, uh, opportunities that we've never had, and I hope I can come back to that as we go on. But we need um, uh, what we had when oil and gas arrived. We need a pipeline of people coming on, being trained, being ready for the industry, and we haven't even yet properly articulated what some of the green jobs are going to be. So we need a lot of government backing on that, but I think what the government needs to do is actually talk to us more. Um, and not just, just have us bidding for projects. They need a team of people, of peripatetic people, who are all around Scotland talking to us about what we're doing, going back and offering us the help that we need to get there. The speed of movement at the moment is astonishing. I've never seen anything like it in my long lifetime. Um, and government should be helping us through support and helping us catalyse all this action. A lot of it will be private sector, there's no doubt about that, but government could give us an awful lot more strategic help and just help with listening uh, and, and, and delivering what they can. Thank you. 
Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Margaret. You raise a number of uh, interesting points. I'm sure we'll, we'll explore them in further detail. Uh, Simon Fieldhouse, same question to you, please. Uh, thank you, convener. I think um, listening, obviously, to the discussion today, uh, an awful lot of the points have probably already been been, been sort of covered um, in terms of sort of some of the similar issues around resourcing that uh, that we seem to face. What's well, not on the same level, I suppose, in terms of the population pressures as the first three panel members this morning. We, like uh, like obviously a colleague from uh, Highland Council, obviously have a, a significant challenge with the rurality that we face. Um, it brings both challenges and opportunities when we look at net zero, but the resources, um, I think, come back to obviously that we, we don't have enough in place at this moment in time in terms of the, the, the funding to move this forward at pace that is required. All the expertise, I think, is something that uh, has been touched on already in terms of the skill set that's required, both within council officers and obviously how we can support our external partners. We're aware, obviously, within Dumfries and Galloway, that obviously what we're looking at is not just uh, a council trying to be net zero, but how we can obviously support the region, and that requires significant interface with obviously our public sector, private sector, communities, third sector, um, you know, to ensure that obviously they are moving at pace, are able to exploit and identify opportunities and have the right skills and expertise to back that in terms of making the right choices when we look at net zero. Um, so I think sort of it's a it's a dual approach that we need to be effectively trying to identify those resources, both in terms of the budget and also the staff and the skills that they need to obviously move that forward at pace. That, thanks very much, Simon. And it would be good, I think, um, given the predominantly rural nature of the areas uh, you operate within to, to hear what particular challenges uh, are um, you face in, in the context of that rural setting because we've uh, panel one was very much obviously three city councils. The second question I had uh, in panel one is, is the same question I would like to raise now in relation to the heat in building strategy. Um, the target of one million homes across Scotland to become energy efficient and have zero emission heating by 2030. Um, what challenges does that present you with in terms of the, the, the rural setting? And uh, Margaret, you mentioned this question of finance. Presumably, the question of how this is going to be financed is still an open question. You mentioned uh, a lack of strategic discussions between local authorities and the Scottish Government. Is this an area where this further uh, strategic dialogue needs to take place. So I'd like to ask you both uh, those questions with a particular emphasis on the uh, required financing and how this is all going to be financed. I, again, Margaret, perhaps start with you and then Simon. It's a thought front of my mind. Most days, except from keeping people warm, um, our, all of our attention has been focused on fuel poverty uh, this winter. Uh, and this is at the core of what we're doing. Um, uh, right. So, um, uh, yes, uh, it's everyone says it's going to be hugely expensive. We're going to have to find uh, better ways uh, of fina of um, uh, of uh, doing this, or else it's not going to happen by 2030. It's the biggest challenge we probably have from the point of view of delivery. Um, uh, you can you can put up an offshore wind farm quicker than we're going to solve this one. Uh, that's that's for sure. Um, uh, we've got 15,000 council houses, and we can make a start with that because we've got the housing revenue capital, and we'll be um, uh, we're investing that. But but it's uh, it's it's not enough. Uh, um, if we do what we need to do for retrofitting, it means that um, new bathrooms, uh, you know, and uh, many other uh, changes that people want in their homes are going to have to take very second place. But, but but this is the most important thing that we're doing, so we're making a start on that. But the private sector, there's very little to help people out there. Um, I look at my own house, uh, sort of post-Second War austerity, absolutely cracker. Uh, I think a lot of people up in Highlands call them Doran houses. Old as heck. Uh, it's the old uh, one warm room uh, uh, model uh, that so many people have with their older houses. And um, when I look at what it's going to cost to upgrade our uh, our insulation to uh, an acceptable level to do this retrofitting, it's going to cost us a hell of a lot more money than we can ever bring in. So I, it, this is not for Scottish Government, this is for both governments. Uh, but what really gets us is that uh, we are becoming and will become massive energy generators in Highland. Uh, our renewable energy is just taking off 
um, at, at an astonishing pace. So we want the Scottish uh, government to uh, we want the Scottish government to give us a hand looking at how we can build a renewable energy fund, a fuel poverty fund. They can call it what they like, but we need to be taking some more of the profit of the energy that's leaving Scotland uh, and, and moving from Highlands to everywhere to invest in our homes. Fuel poverty is the biggest thing that we can do to help our householders cope with their bills and cope with their lives uh, and their health. And I would like to see the government stepping in and looking at how we can actually uh, raise money from all the renewable energy that we're producing um, uh, and or make us partners in it, whatever we have to do uh, to get some money towards our householders. Thanks very much, uh, Margaret. And same question to you, Simon, please. All right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously the, the, the comments that, that Margaret's kind of raised already, um, you know, resonate with what we have here um, across the region. Obviously, when we're looking at, at new new builds, um, life becomes an awful lot easier in terms of how we can obviously look at the effectiveness of making those houses fit for purpose and energy efficient and as carbon negative as possible. Um, what we do have, obviously, given the rurality, is a significant spread of disparate communities that are not necessarily all on um, the existing gas network already and significant fuel poverty across the region, which obviously sort of aims and, well, I suppose sort of contributes obviously to um, some of the issues that we're facing. So looking at how we would retrofit um, those communities, those those issues in buildings um, is a significant one, which obviously creates a significant drain on resources. Uh, obviously, we've got things like our um, strategic housing investment plan, which obviously will support the delivery of uh, housing stock being retrofitted moving forward. We've obviously invested significant sums of money um, through obviously sort of our, our council committees to look at how we can obviously support um, some of our sort of, uh, I suppose, our registered social landlords who look after our housing stock here across the region. But obviously the scale of this is going to be quite fundamental. I don't have an exact figure in terms of how many sort of social housing we have in D&G, but to give a bit of an indication, obviously we had nearly two million pounds worth of funding that supported 210 houses that, uh, you know, in terms of sort of upgrading their solid wall insulation. So that scale multiplied out is going to sort of create a significant drain on resources that we have. And obviously we are looking at how we can work obviously with our, our sort of, I suppose, our, our key public sector partners to, to obviously sort of offset some of that or find new and innovative ways of looking at how we can look at, you know, district heating, which we don't have any in Dumfries and Galloway at this moment in time. But trying to find ways that obviously you know the, the 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 recapturing of heat for other purposes could be obviously offset and utilized to support obviously how we can obviously heat people's homes it becomes a significant challenge as we move forward i mean those those 210 homes that are ref sort of referenced earlier you know we're anticipating that those measures would save around about 8200 tons of carbon in their lifetime so you know that that helps that also helps obviously offset some of the fuel costs that those residents are facing and obviously tackle some of the fuel poverty but in essence everything is all linked together we are aware obviously of the targets we're trying to work towards those as much as possible but the resources and, and how we can get you know significant resources allocated in to support this monumental challenge is going to be quite significant thanks very much a very very brief supplementary from me uh, i mean it sounds like without putting words in your mouth the, the 2030 heat and buildings targets is going to be very, very challenging, if not impossible. Would that be a fair summary? I think that would be a fair summary, um, without a shadow of a doubt. I think all of this is going to be very challenging. It doesn't mean that we won't rise to the challenge, but I think it is going to be sure that uh, you know we need to push this up the agenda and make sure, obviously, it's factored into everything that we do. And Margaret, would that be your sort of overall conclusion on the target? It would. I think this is going to be one of the hardest targets to hit. So we need some milestones. We need to be watching what we're all doing. Uh, and trying hard to find solutions to this, but uh, concentrating on the fabric and retrofitting is where we have to be. Thank you very much. Let me bring in Fiona Hislop. Fiona, over to you, please. Thank you, and thanks for your patience, panel. Um, I'd like to ask about any concerns around carbon offsetting and the purchase of commercial carbon credits and the implication for land use, particularly in your vast geographies. Um, I want to come first to Simon uh, Fieldhouse, so Friesen Gallery has a, a very council has a stringent target of net zero by 2025, but you say yourself you need to consider offsetting residual emissions. So could you comment on whether that's appropriate? But also have you got any concerns about mass forestation, for example, or other uh, use of your land in your area 
um, and what that might mean for net zero and your plans. And then I'll come then to Margaret. And Margaret Davidson, if I can maybe ask you, do you have any concerns about other councils or other organisations, uh, private companies, etc., and their use of your land in the Highlands uh, region uh, and the transparency and accounting of that, uh, if there is specific um, uh, desire uh, to make use of the land capability of the Highlands to meet net zero targets of other organisations. So, can I come to you first, Simon? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, offsetting is is something we're we're looking into um, in terms of sort of how we can can move things forward. You're quite right, Dumfries and Galloway. You know, we've got a significant um, benefit, I suppose, and, and an opportunity with our land mass in terms of how rural it is, the the amount of forestry, the amount of sort of peatland we have. Um, but obviously, what we also need to know is obviously that we are quite a significant agricultural sector, particularly obviously with within things like dairy. Um, that obviously have quite a high, um, quite a high sort of emission, I suppose, when we're looking at these things. So one of the key things that we're looking at locally is obviously how we can look at, I suppose, integrated land use to obviously sort of allow us the opportunity to identify opportunities for either investment through that be sort of using natural sort of capital solutions. Look at how we can sequester carbon better through, I suppose, sort of rewetting some of our peatland or looking at making sure that we have the right tree in the right place in terms of our forestry moving forward. There are significant drawbacks, I suppose, when we're looking at how the region could, uh, and I suppose if you take, for example, our energy production at this moment in time, we produce significantly more energy like Highland than we actually use in terms of, say, our electrical generation from the onshore wind farms and offshore wind farms that we have, our hydro schemes, that obviously sort of our local residents are not necessarily getting the local benefit, but we're obviously supporting Scotland's targets and the UK's targets to be obviously sort of, you know, a, a green energy producer. But I think Margaret mentioned earlier about obviously how we can you know try and tap into some of those benefits and, and bring that back to look at how locally we can obviously sort of if we have a wind farm how we can then sort of generate better opportunities for uh, rewilding or supporting our residents to sort of become much more net zero uh, on on the whole. I think sort of obviously if we look at you know corporate or the opportunity for um, capital offsetting at a more corporate market, I think we need to obviously look at how that would be regulated and how we can obviously make sure that carbon accounting means that we're not double accounting um, from, from our perspective. So I think there's there's some support that we would obviously would recognise and would like to think obviously that there would be a national standard that would be brought in on these things that would allow us to obviously make that a much better system, a much more sort of robust system for when we actually get to the point of actually identifying what carbon offsetting could be undertaken. Thank you, and I can come to Margaret on land use and perhaps and that idea of a national standard and double counting. Yes, um, uh, that's an interesting one, Simon. Thank you. Right, hello, Fiona. Um, good New Year to you. Um, uh, right, okay. If I could just make a very quick statement before we start, there is absolutely no way uh, that Scotland is going to get uh, uh, towards net zero. Uh, without what uh, what they what is happening in our rural areas, and of course we've got the biggest rural area. Uh, what we've got is land in quantity, um, and what we've also got is renewable energy in quantity. Uh, it's extraordinary what's happening just now, um, uh, and um, uh, we're going to have that and the hydrogen that that will be producing in huge quantities. So this is about real importance uh, for Scotland for getting towards net zero. So we really do need to concentrate on this. What is happening at the moment um, is that carbon offsetting is starting. Um, uh, private firms are already going to some of the big estates and they are getting um, uh, tree planting happening, maybe some, uh, 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 maybe some peat restoration. But we need to do this in, a, in an ordered way. And again, we need to get some benefit for the local people who are seeing this all happen. Uh, around them, whereas they still pay more on their electricity bill than anywhere else in the country. Um, uh, so this this is crazy, and we do really need to make that just transition work, because if we don't, this will become solid capitalism. Uh, estates and rich men will get richer, uh, and uh, people living in our cities and in our very poor rural areas sometimes will get much poorer because we're not doing this in the strategic way that we need to do it. Uh, Highland has a massive offering here, uh, but we do need to do it in a way that supports people. Uh, and we also need to make sure that the, the standard is good, 
because you can't have greenwashing. You need to, if you're going to give money to people to um, uh, to do carbon offsetting, you need to be sure that they've got a plan to actually reduce their carbon footprint to zero and not just buy their way out of it. So that that is a, a standard is really important. Thank, thank you very much, Shana. I'm going to pass back to the convener, uh, Dean Lockhart, now. But uh, if there is anything additional the the two councils want to say on uh, their relationship with the private sector and uh, financial s services in particular, maybe they could follow up in writing if there's something they want to add to our interest in that area. So back to the convener. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Uh, next up, Monica Lennon to be followed by Natalie Dawn. Monica, over to you, please. Thank you, convener. Um, I want to pick up questions on the circular economy and recycling, um, like I did with the last panel. But, um, Councillor Davidson, I was quite struck by what you said in your opening remarks. Um, you said we need a more, or we need more strategic help from from central government, from Scottish government, and we need more listening. And I've been following a bit of a a row in the press where I think all of the council leaders wrote to the first minister pre-Christmas to ask for an urgent meeting. Understand that meeting hasn't been granted. So, can you just elaborate by what you mean about more listening, and can you give an example of where you would like to see more strategic support from the Scottish government? Uh, I think what is happening is in Scotland at the moment, and and it, and it is different in different areas. There's no doubt about that, and I think it's really important for the government to. To, uh, to give us that strategic underpinning that we need, so that uh, when we're dealing with, um, say, for instance, the uh, the wind generating section, that we actually say at the moment they don't have to give us anything. They don't have to give the community that they uh, that they take their energy from anything. So all they need to do is pay a rent to the landlord. Um, most of them are, are generous enough to do community benefit, but it's peanuts. It's absolute peanuts. So we need to get to a point where actually the government needs more than just um, uh, encouraging them. That we need to get to a point where there will be an expectation that when they get their uh, their, their planning, that there will be an expectation that they actually invest locally, that they actually um, uh, contribute to a, a fuel poverty uh, fund or whatever we end up doing. I think this is the sort of listening that we need to do, and we need to go back and talk about it. It is the big things. Um, uh, uh, we don't want to be controlled, but we do need the strategic support so that we can get out there uh, and uh, and do these things ourselves. And that is a miss. That is a miss. Thank you. And I wonder if I can put that issue to Simon from an operational point of view. Um, because Councillor Davidson talked about, um, you know, not just bidding for projects. We need to kind of move beyond that. I know we get lots of money for for pilots, and maybe the the, the sustainable funding isn't there. I wonder, if Simon, if you could comment on that from an operational point of view, um, and if you agree um, with Councillor Davidson, a more strategic approach would be helpful in terms of the the, the net zero journey. I certainly. I mean, I, I think without a shadow of a doubt, from an operational perspective, that the more strategic link-ups we can have, um, the better. When you look at net zero, um, it can't be just looked in isolation. It covers a significant range of different services. Pretty much every single council service we have, obviously, will need to obviously be playing its role to support our journey on on to sort of towards net zero. Therefore, obviously, you know, if you just look at sort of the different council services from waste to transport, you know, we we need to have a much more Strategic interface with with the national government to ensure, obviously, that sort of uh, the the targets, the opportunities, are not being missed. The opportunity to bid in for pilots and funding um, is fantastic. Don't get me wrong; that's always appreciated. Um, but an example where that but doesn't necessarily sort of um, fall, fall, I suppose, sort of follow through would be the the new regional land use partnerships that we've got. Um, that obviously we've been identified as the south of Scotland as a a pilot area. So there's funding being put into place. But to actually realise the aspirations of the pilot scheme, um, significantly more funding should have been made available, but but hasn't. So obviously, and this is looked at as being short term. Yet obviously, this focuses on land use, integrated land use. How we can obviously make differences in terms of how we can work with farmers, with estate holders, 
to actually look at how we might be in a position to influence their management of the land, which obviously has a benefit for sequestration um, and everything else. So I think the opportunity for a much more strategic dialogue it, to allow us to obviously all be very much inputting into this journey that we're making towards sort of uh, net neutral for Scotland by 2042 is really of critical importance given the timelines that we're looking at. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I'll pivot back to circular economy and recycling because you know that as part of the inquiry, we're keen to understand how councils are working with a whole range of partners um, on those aims. We heard from our um, city colleagues earlier about the challenges around uh, recycling, um, and I wonder why you both think rates um, are, are quite low, what you think needs to change, and given there is a lot of focus just now on the, the role of incinerators and the waste hierarchy, um, what is the, the view, if there is one at the moment, and your own authorities, um, if we do see a, a moratorium or a, a, a ban? On those types of facilities. And maybe come back to, to Margaret first of all on that one. Okay. Thank you, Monica. Um, uh, the, uh, everyone wants to recycle more. That's absolutely right. Uh, but, but we all need to be acutely aware of what's happening to our recyclate um, uh, when it leaves us. Uh, and we also need to be far more aware of the practicality of of of, um, uh, of, of uh, dealing with more. I want Highland to deal with Highland's waste. Uh, I don't want to be trucking it down the road, which is what we have to do at the moment. We're still doing landfill um, uh, along in Aberdeenshire uh, and and paying through the nose for it. Uh, and and th we want that to stop. But what's the alternative for us? Um, right, we get our recycling rate up. Right, we get our reuse and, uh, and repair rates up, and we do and we do uh, 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 a fair bit like that. We're doing um, a big, um, um, I don't know what the term is. Uh, my waste terms are not great, but it's really a sorting place, a big uh, a big place where we're going to be sorting our recyclate, uh, uh, bulking it up much more efficiently. So that will improve things. This will all improve things. Our recycling rate at the moment is around 45, 46, um, and, and that's a challenge in itself. Uh, imagine what you do if you're up at Tongue in uh, Northwest Sutherland with your recycling, uh, and where you get that so that it can be shipped down the road. Um, um, it's not it's not simple, and it's very expensive. And transport is a massive issue uh, for us. But we're now looking at the prospect of uh, if we don't do an energy from waste plant to um, uh, to uh, to deal with what we have, we will be trucking our waste down the country when, when there's a landfill ban to the north of England. That will be a seller's market. Uh, not only that, um, it, it, it goes against every grain in, in, in my body. It absolutely does. Um, and um, uh, we need to find solutions, and we've, um, we haven't got long to do it. Uh, we've been around this one time and again. Um, uh, we were very impressed with the, the modern energy from waste plants. We have got areas very close to where we were thinking it could be um, to do district heating schemes, but we've got to turn every stone over to do this. But I don't want to be, in five years' time, trucking waste uh, down the A9 to the north of England. That is not what we want to do. Uh, but if we can't make that circular economy work, in five years' time. That is what we will be doing. Thank you very much, Councillor Davidson. I'll turn to Simon now. When Margaret's touched on the, the polluter pays principle. Um, but again, just if we can put the question back to you, Simon, from a, a Davis and Galloway perspective, please. I thank thank you. I mean, I think obviously we've we've kind of I suppose come come to this table slightly late. Um, we did have obviously sort of a, a, what we class as an echo deco plant um, that obviously sorted most of our waste previously, but obviously we've we've just recently changed our our recycling systems in Dumfries and Galloway following a pilot um, in the west of the region. So our recycling rates are probably significantly lower um, than than the sort of the average across Scotland. But they are improving and increasing. So we've obviously worked very hard um, as part of the consultation phase. We've obviously engaged with people like uh, local groups of Friends of the Earth and others to ensure, obviously, that our recycling regime and our waste collection regime um, are actually sort of fit for purpose. So we are now seeing a significant uplift in terms of our recycling rates for 
plastics, for for paper, for card, for um, for, for tin cans. Obviously, we've also sort of put uh, over 90 sort of communal sort of glass bins across the region to ensure, obviously, that we can we can ensure and increase um, a recycling rate on these things. Those rates are going up. Um, there's anecdotal evidence that we're sort of we're, we are increasing significantly following this. Uh, this has only been introduced, I think, since last September. So we are moving in the right direction. Um, I would echo the sentiments of Margaret. I would love to see and be in a position to understand that obviously the waste created in Dumfries and Galloway is reused. But I think fundamentally, when we look at obviously sort of the circular economy, which I think you mentioned earlier, one of the key things we need to look at doing is trying to ensure that we can find ways of reducing the amount of waste that actually enters that system by reusing in the first place. So from that perspective, we've actually sort of uh, we've working with um, a community sort of third sector group within Stranra called the Stranra Reuse Centre, where we're obviously looking at providing sort of additional support through some of the funding that we have available to us to look at obviously how they can increase their their opportunities to support their local community. So they will repurpose, um, you know, cookers, repurpose sort of bikes and everything else to ensure that these things are not entering. Um, the waste chain at that point, so it's it's a question of reusing and, and looking at how we can obviously we can continue their funding. So those models are there from a community perspective that have been identified in terms of how they would like to see things moving forward. And obviously through our involvement, we'd like to take that and look at that in terms of how we could obviously support other groups across the region who want, might wish to do or might wish to undertake a certain sort of facility. I think there are, from a personal perspective and from an operational perspective. There are other examples out there, both within the UK and, and across Europe, in terms of how um, cities or municipalities have the, the, the real opportunity to look at waste as a as a as a as an opportunity, as a, as sort of a, a real cash value to these things. If you look at Copenhagen, obviously their their waste collection is run on a just in time system in terms of their sort of their their street bins, but obviously they also created a fantastic facility which houses a ski slope, climbing frame, and Cafe on top of basically their their waste incineration plant, which obviously provides sort of um, district heating to a significant number of residents. I believe around about sixty thousand homes have heating from that. So we there are lessons out there that we can learn from. I think one of the issues that we face is obviously scale that we're a significantly wide, very rural region, and obviously our waste collection um, is is quite fragmented. Um, and obviously we need to look at obviously how we can maximise those systems to ensure that we're we're not wasting any energy either in collecting waste. Or in terms of how we process and deal with that. Thank you, Simon and Councillor Davidson. I'll pass back to the convener. Thanks very much, Monica. Let me bring in Natalie Dawn to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Natalie, over to you, please. Thanks, convener, and thanks again to the panel uh, for your attendance today. So. I think we looks like Natalie's having some technical issues. So why while Natalie tries to come back online, can I pass over to Mark Ruskell to ask his questions? Mark, over to you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Kavina. Um okay, so I wanted to ask you both about um transport. Um I'm sure we could do an hour on transport, um, but we, we don't have that time. But uh, perhaps if I could just sort of break it down a little bit. I mean the first panel talked about very much an urban context. Um, how we get you know, road traffic reduction within that urban context, issues of air quality. The situation that your two councils in are obviously different in that you've got urban centres, but you've also got a wider rural population. So what do you see as the kind of the biggest um, reduction? Where can you get the biggest reductions of emissions in terms of you know, climate policy, uh, transport policy uh, within your areas? What are you really focusing on for those urban populations um, but also for the rural populations as well. What are the kind of infrastructure projects, partnerships, uh, policy approaches that you're taking uh, to get the, the carbon reduction for both those types of, uh, of settlements within your area? Um, can um, we start with right. Margaret, actually? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, I wasn't sure if you'd asked. Right, um, thank you. Um, right, it is. Um, uh, what you have in a, a huge um, uh, rural area like Highland are failing systems sometimes. Um, public transport doesn't work very well out in the, uh, out in the country. Um, uh, 
Uh, school transport costs us an absolute fortune. We get uh, within our annual grant um, around five million pound for school transport, uh, home to school transport. It costs us 13 million. So every year we are subsidising that because we have to get the children to school. And we'd love to get to a system where we've um, uh, where we've got uh, more efficient uh, rural transport. This is this is the, the big one. Inverness itself is slowly coming around. Difficult, my gosh! Um, all of us in Highland, and I include myself in that, are very wedded to um, old four by fours or diesel cars, and it's going to take some doing to get people out of it. In fact, they're all they're always going to be here for some areas. Um, but we need to get moving on the electrification. We've got some really good programs of putting in the EV chargers. Um, you'll know um, the famous North Coast 500 right around the, uh, the top of Highland and back down. Um, we've got a scheme for putting EV chargers all the way around there, and hopefully, um, if we get <laughs> leveling up money, um, uh, that that will help us um, electrify uh, the route because we're really wanting to. Um, uh, get people out of their cars into at least electric cars. But the big one, the big gain for us would be if we can get hydrogen fuel into our big our HGVs, our big transport, our rural transport uh, around um, uh, doing the linking in. Then it's hearts and minds, and that is the really difficult bit of getting people to use public transport, to use uh, some sort of communal transport organisation. But it's absolutely vital. Otherwise, we will continue to have a, a disparate um, uh, population, absolutely dependent at this time of year on gritters getting to their door, um, or they or they're stuck. So, what we have at the moment is is not sustainable. But we we want to sustain our communities. So this is going to be community by community, um, hard thinking, and it's not going to be cheap. Uh, so. We do need to uh, get ourselves that uh, green finance officer. Like crikey, we do. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the uh, the road traffic reduction target for 2030, I mean, is that how would you interpret that target as a council? Would you see that as primarily falling on reducing mileage within the cities, or would you focus in on trying to reduce the the more long distance mileage across the region? Yeah. Um, uh, well, the easy hit is, is the city, uh, and we will make progress there. I've got no doubt. And some of our um, bigger small towns, if you like, like Nairn, um, uh, Tain, say for instance, um, uh, th these are um, Thurso. These are places where we can uh, make a difference. But the big gain is from the long distance transport, the wood lorries, um, uh, the the waste vehicles, the um, the oil. Um, uh, the oil lorries um, delivering to every corner of the Highlands, and uh, because we're, um, we're hardly any of our, our, our of the Highlands is on the gas network, so um, oil is the predominant fuel just now. The big, the thing that's going to make the big difference to us is the move towards electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel. And what we've got to do as a council is to uh, think of the infrastructure we need about that and try and make it work as best we can. EV chargers were on the way. Um, hydrogen fuel, way to go. Okay, thanks. And can I get a Dumfries and Gary perspective as well, please? Yes, certainly. I mean, I, th I think I'd, I'd, I'd echo an awful lot that, uh, that that Margaret's kind of already said. One of the key things that we're finding is obviously is that when we look at where we need to be moving forward, it is about trying to create that infrastructure. So we've looked at obviously our provision of EV chargers. One of the things that we are trying to do at the moment is obviously look at how we as a local authority can reduce our own um i suppose sort of carbon footprint through through our fleet so we have a plan by 2025 that obviously all of our light fleet and um sort of cars that we that we have as part of the pool will all be electric and we are working obviously we've got a couple of uh, electric sort of uh, waste collection vehicles that operate within Dumfries at this moment in time and we are moving towards obviously sort of you know an ultra low emission sort of vehicle framework for our larger fleet and obviously sort of trying to work obviously with our with our bus providers but we are aware obviously and i, I sort of recognize the comments margaret made around obviously sort of how public transport you know struggles within sort of large rural regions and we have an awful lot of obviously people utilizing obviously their own cars 
and hence obviously the, the need to obviously look at that infrastructure charging network across the region to ensure that people feel comfortable and confident that if they're traveling from Stranra to Langham in an electric vehicle that there will be adequate electric vehicle charging points along the route or at their destination to ensure that they are able um, to, to make that transition from diesel or petrol across to electric. We're aware obviously at this moment in time that uh, you know that that requires further investment and, uh, and and we're pushing that at this moment in time to, to move that one forward. One of the key issues that we've got obviously is with the trunk roads in the region, the A75, the 76, the 77 and obviously the A1M that, that passes through the region. There is significant emissions um, that obviously come from the freight that moves along sort of the Euro route and obviously we are would love to be in a position to look at alternatives. Um, Margaret's touched on hydrogen. Obviously, there is a necessity to look at whether we can create a hydrogen hub in the southwest to obviously facilitate and, and look at providing the, the heavier goods vehicles the opportunity to move on to a hydrogen base. Or we need to be looking, obviously, at other alternatives such as the rail network and whether there is opportunity to push more freight onto that, which could be then either electrified or utilise hydrogen. But I think the challenges that are that are there they are significant just because of how people obviously live in in very isolated pockets and it is about obviously how we can facilitate that transition to electric vehicles in relation to the point made about obviously sort of meeting the 2030 targets i think as, as margaret's kind of said obviously it will be easier within the towns and cities to look at obviously how we can change people's um, patterns how we can put in sort of additional cycling and walking ways how we can obviously ensure that people obviously use the car as a, as a last resort and how we can obviously make the bus network and links within the town much more sustainable, easier to use, and, and obviously sort of you know a lower emission vehicle. How we tackle um, reducing mileage out with that is going to be very very tricky at this moment in time. Okay, thanks very much. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. I, I I'll just ask the same questions I asked earlier. I put two questions in one, and I'll direct them to Margaret and then Simon, please. Um, you both talked about resources and the uh, funding uh, already this morning. Now, the Scottish government draft budget uh, cuts, depending on who you read, between about three and four hundred million pounds from council budget. So, the first question is, what are the implications? of the draft budget for your council's delivery of net zero ambitions and then given the significant increase in funding that is ring fenced uh, does your local authority have sufficient flexibility to nevertheless deliver on its net zero ambitions yeah, so margaret first okay thank you um uh uh what is it it's a uh, it's a headache um uh it it, it is a challenge what we've done over the years, and we, remember, we've had 10 years or more of this um, uh, cut, cut, cut to local government. We've got to the point where we've got really thin uh, layers of management and, and senior managers, uh, and um, it, it just gets harder to deal with uh, with anything. Uh, we're needing to do quite a lot of strategic work on our uh, on our net zero plans, and we're wanting to do what we call the Highland Adapts, which is we can't do anything unless we do it in partnership. We're absolutely crystal clear about that. But that needs people to deliver that that strategy. It needs people to keep the partnership going and to service it. And and we don't have that staff at the moment. And what the budget does is it just makes it harder and harder uh, to be able to do uh, this sort of catalyzing and leadership that we want to do uh, within the net zero arena. So it, it just makes it tougher. Um, and the ring fencing, I mean, yes, there's a significant increase, if you like, in local government funding this year, but it is all increased. It is for specific purposes. So we can't uh, use that to, um, uh, to, to work with our carbon footprint. There's nothing in there uh, that, that will help us with that. So we carry on. What I want to do is, though, look at ways that we can help government um, uh, help us, because they have their challenges. They can't borrow. Uh, as much as they want to. Um, uh, UK government funding this time round was reasonable, um, uh, but you know we, we we've got a long way to go. And I'm really keen that we um, we look at some more revolving funding. Uh, if it, I'll give you an instance, we have um, we're the biggest taker up as in the country for um, a revolving fund uh, which. Uh, is being used um, uh, for, for low carbon for, uh, projects. I'm trying to remember the name of it. it. Begins with an S. It'll come to me. 
um, uh, and and that's fine. Um, uh, we 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 need to. We're, we're taking that money. We're we're investing it. We're going to be uh, uh, paying it back, but but we've got the ability to borrow it again. So um, uh, and we've done that with a lot of development projects. We've got a revolving uh, um, land fund. We've got a revolving infrastructure fund where we can move things on uh, that are stuck because they need to build a roundabout and they pay us back as the houses are built and all the rest of it. And um, this is one way that we've got around some of the big stoppers and I'd like the government to uh, to look at that again uh, and th that would be helpful. And the other deal for us uh, is our city deal. We have, uh, we're one of the older ones and our city deal is um, two, uh, two big, um, uh, two big, um, well, roads, um, one of which we need for the development in East Inverness. The other one, uh, we can't get Transport Scotland to seriously move along on it, change the focus and get us to where we are. So all of this takes officer time uh, and, it takes, um, and it takes a knowledge base that, that it's really difficult to build on uh, with the cuts and squeezes that we get through local government. I, um, as a, as a as a local budget settlement this year, it is supremely unhelpful. Uh, Simon, any comments on this? Um, I'm, I'm sure my chief finance officer would have significantly more comments to make. Um, all I would say is, obviously, I'd, I'd echo some of those comments that the issues that we've had in relation, obviously, to um, constant sort of budget reductions and obviously a reprioritization of our settlements does make life very, very difficult for us to actually deliver um, at the pace that we, we recognise that we would like to move at to obviously to, to ensure that we're meeting the targets and I suppose contributing towards uh, ensuring that we don't uh, top over the 1.5 degree threshold. The, the the budget settlement effectively means that obviously we've still got you know the range of activities that we're looking at, but we're going to need to obviously bring those to committee and obviously look at how they're prioritised against other other sort of I suppose budget pressures that we have. Um, one of the key points I think that that, that 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 Margaret obviously touched on is obviously is, is that we as a local authority I think in the region we have just under one percent of the total emissions come from our council and the council sort of operations. It's about how we can then look at reaching out and working with our partners um, and obviously that requires the opportunity to look at you know what funding might be available, how we can fund feasibility studies, how we can get people on board and come with solutions which obviously requires resources to be to be available and present which are maybe not necessarily there in the quantity that we need at this moment in time there are some light um we have obviously we've got the regional growth deal for the region which is the borderlands deal which has the energy master plan as part of that which will see i believe around about 14 million pounds worth of investment looking at sort of uh, solutions and, and a, a whole sort of a whole life system sort of approach to our energy management and demand for the south of scotland but obviously even that recognises that actually that's phase one, that's very, very positive, but it's phase two that brings in the additional investment and it's how that is not yet clear quite how we will fund that one moving forward. So I think obviously the resources does create a bit of a headache if we're not in a position to obviously align those with the aspirations or the, 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 the minimal requirements to obviously ensure that we can move this forward. Thanks very much, Liam. I believe that Natalie Dawn uh, has been able to reconnect, and uh, if so, Natalie, I'll hand over to you for your questions. Thanks, convener. I'm very sorry about the technical issues I've had this morning. Um, so the answers to most of my questions have actually been covered in your responses to Monica. Um, however, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the efforts that are being pursued in your areas um, to support the development of a circular economy and the key partners that are involved in that. Um, so are there any innovative local economic models that are being developed in your area around, for example, reducing waste, reuse and repair and recycling? And Simon, I know that you had already touched on this a little bit in one of your previous responses. So if I could put this to Margaret first and Simon, if you've got anything to add, that would be great. If I was brutally honest, Natalie, I'd say not enough. Um, it is being done just now and we need to go back to it um, uh, and concentrate on it. You know, from one one month to the next, uh, you, you, you know, various priorities are there. But at the moment, we're trying to balance the budget. As I said, it was unhelpful. Um, uh, seriously trying. Uh, whereas we should be out there thinking about, okay, um, uh, you know, if we're we're saying we want a waste to energy plan, is there any way we can avoid it by doing more ourselves and getting the systems uh, uh, set up for a circular economy? Difficult in a big scattered rural area because you do get infrastructure failure. 
um, uh, you know, being able to send uh, lorries up uh, some of our croft roads, it just isn't going to be an option. Um, so you do get failures and you do need to cope with those because you can't abandon people. Uh, and and uh, so therefore we we need to learn from others. Uh, I'm not going to flannel you anymore. I think we've got a hell of a lot more to do. We've got some very good officers who are doing their um, uh, their, their level best, but I think this needs to do. Uh, it needs to bring in the private sector, uh, the local community sector, as much as we can. Our strength has always come from community growth and community initiatives, uh, and it's it's time we got back out there. Thanks, Margaret. All right, Simon. I'm not sure if you've got anything to add on to that. Oh uh, yeah, just 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 a couple of quick points. Um, obviously, the circular economy is something that you know we we, we recognise as we move forward. It needs to play much more of a role. We're just in the process of undertaking our roads review, and one of the key things that we've made us to sort of put in is obviously is the need to look at obviously what happens with um, the the raw materials and I suppose the waste materials from that in terms of how we can look at uh, utilising those. Uh, at a much better level locally, um, to obviously avoid sort of some of the the carbon footprint with with moving those. Um, we are hoping, obviously, that that more ideas such as the the Strand Railway Use and uh, sort of project will come out of our engagement through our citizens panel, which we're in the process of setting up now. So we're identifying obviously key players um, across the region, and we're obviously looking at utilising them to obviously you know provide additional support, community engagement. Uh, and opportunities around sort of you know key areas that they would like to see moving forward, but I, I do think obviously that uh, you know it's about how we take our partners with us on this. That uh, you know we as a local authority can do so much, but obviously I believe it's actually how we can embed that idea within the community and get people focusing on that to come up with local solutions that are going to provide provide the best uh, I suppose best results in the long run. Thank you. It's been very interesting to hear the different uh, difficulties and impacts based on the rural and urban settings, but um, that answers all my questions, so I'll hand back to the convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. And that brings us to the end of our allocated time. Let me just uh, thank Margaret and Simon very much for taking part and for your insights today. It was a, an extremely helpful session, and um, apologies again for running late, but I'm, I'm also glad you uh, were able to uh, watch the panel one and uh, enjoyed the panel one witness session. Uh, so thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day. You can leave the meeting by pressing the red telephone icon at the top right hand side of your screen. The final agenda item today for the committee is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating on devolved matters using powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. This is in relation to the following proposed UK statutory instrument, the Pesticides Revocation EU Exit Regulations 2022. This notification is a Type 1 consent notification. The Committee's role in relation to Type 1 notifications is to decide whether it agrees with the Scottish Government's proposal to consent to the UK Government making regulations within devolved competence. I refer members to paper 3 and to the private legal and policy briefing members have received with their papers for this meeting. The question for the committee now is whether we agree with the Scottish Government that the environmental provisions set out in the notification should be included in the UK SI. Before I put that question to the committee, I will ask if anyone has any questions. There are none. On that basis, do we agree with the Scottish Government that the environmental provisions set out in the notification should be included in the UK SI? That is agreed. Thank you very much. The committee will write to the Scottish Government accordingly. And on that basis, I close the public session of this meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>